Matthew chapter 6. I want to read the most famous prayer, I guess, in Christianity. And I want to deal with that in my day sessions. And I'll do something different on the night that I minister. But I'm tired. Let me just say, let me preface this in saying this. Not long ago, I was in a convention. There was four other speakers and me all at the same time. Now, you know, going on at this thing. So and I was the last one to come up. This is and they asked us to just say a few words and, if, you know, before the, uh, the meeting would start. And I said, OK. So, you know, like, and all of all four of them got up and said, God going to do this. God going to do that. Lord Jesus. God. And people screaming, you know, when you get get that hooping. Ha, you know, going. God going to do this. God going to do that. I'll tell you, God going to do this. When they came to me, I said, when? <laughs> I am tired of going up. When? How many of y'all agree with me? I mean, I'm glad God is going to do something, but Lord Jesus, I need something done today. You understand what I'm saying? I'm tired of going. I'm tired of putting faith in the future. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, one now faith is. It's a now thing. It has the ability to create a future, but it's made for now. Because you don't need any of this stuff when you get to heaven. You don't need no money when you get to heaven. You don't need health in any way, shape, or form when you get there because there's no way you could ever get sick. So we need it today. Do you agree with that? And you know, God agreed with it. And Christianity, it, just, it went right over religion's head. And I want to read this verse here in Matthew chapter 6. We'll start reading with, uh, oh, verse 9. What verse 8? Be not ye therefore like unto them for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him verse 9 after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done where where as it is where now God means what he says and says what he means his will be done in earth on earth, however you want to say it, as it is in heaven. But let's just face it, that's not happening. And sometimes, every once in a while, but the Bible said, and he put it in red so you couldn't miss it. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want to talk in my day sessions about living out the will of God on the earth today. Because I don't need any of this when I get to heaven. Now look what it says, our father. It starts off with our father. You got to know who he is. Not a father. Not some father. But our father. That means we're not servants. That means we're sons and daughters. We're family. We're la familia. Like they say. Our father. So he tells us who he is. Who art in heaven. So you got to know where your dad is. You got to know that. So in heaven is where he is and where he is on earth. He's in both places at the same time. You have to understand that we can mess up something in heaven today, but what we do upon the earth today. What? Oh, yeah, we can mess up something in heaven. He's because what happens here a lot of times determines what happens there. The Bible said what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, right? What you loose on earth. So notice that. You are affecting heaven's economy and heaven's way of doing things today in Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, this is going to be good. Lord Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? Why? How can you do that? Because you are a family member just living in another place. You understand that? That's why I'm going to be. I don't want you to miss any of my sessions because I've got more light on this thing and it's going to help you. So I realize that what I do can, can determine what an angel will do on earth as well as what an angel will do in heaven. Did you get that? Because Father God in heaven, Father God on the earth, Christ in you, hope of glory. So our Father, that's who he is, not a father or some father, but our Father. In heaven where he is and where he is on earth, in you, hallowed be thy name. Notice he said, hallowed be thy name. So his name, write this down if you can, his name is equal to himself. 
Because when the Lord gave us power of attorney to use the name of Jesus, that's as if Jesus was standing right there and says, this is what I command. So his name is equal to himself. That's why he said, hallowed be thy name. It's a precious name. My God, it's a name of power. And we have the power of attorney to use that name. Which means you become that person when someone signs a power of attorney over to you. If Brother Copeland, Sister Copeland would give me power of attorney over their personal affairs and this ministry, I could sell it all because I would become Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. Simply by a piece of paper. That's how powerful a power of attorney is. That's what the Lord gave us. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? Now, it, I'm talking about living out the will of God in the earth. I ain't talking about when I get to heaven. I'm not there yet. I'm dealing with what's happening here today or tomorrow. So his name is equal to himself. He said, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Now that's his mission. Write that down. Thy kingdom come. That's his mission. That's what he does. God or Christ in you is kingdom minded. You must be kingdom minded. Now watch this. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now his desire is exactly the same for the earth as it is for heaven. Oh, by my sake. Oh, I can say it. I can say it in the Holy Ghost. Please. I got to watch myself. The earth was not created for sinners. There were no sinners when God created this place. It was created for family. For me and you. Somebody shout over that. Do you hear? It was created for us. And then given to us by God in Psalms 115 verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. Now I know there's another psalm that says the earth is the Lord's until he gave it to you. So that power of attorney is in operation today. Now that lease is going to run out when Christ comes back. At, uh, not at the rapture, but at when it, it's all over and said and done with. Then we're going back to Genesis where God had power and authority. Now I'm going to say something going to shock you. God has great power on the earth, but he doesn't have authority. Now don't you cut that television off. You listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. That's why God doesn't speak against earthquakes. Tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, bridges falling down. That's not his job. Though he gave you dominion and authority over all the works of his hands. That's our job to speak against those things. That's why the Red Sea did not open up until Moses put the stick out there. God had the power to open up the Red Sea, but not the authority to do it. What? Because he has given dominion over the works of his hand to mankind. That's why Moses said, that's why God told Moses, what are you crying out to me for? You the one with the stick. Stretch the stick. I'll open the sea. Somebody shout over this. Right? Oh, glory to God. I want you to see this. He says, his will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, what does that mean, as it is in heaven? God is no respecter of persons on earth or in heaven. If it happens in heaven, it must happen here. And if it happens here, it affects what happens there. Did you get that? I want you to think, meditate, concentrate on that. That's why Satan hates you, because you have power in two places. Jesus, help me, Lord. You have power in two places. You can shut down heaven as well as shut down the earth. You. That's the power and the authority that Christ has given us. That's why Christianity is attacked so much. Buddhism is not attacked so much. Did I say it right, Kathy? Buddhism? I don't know. You know, Buddha, the big boy. You know, Buddha. Don't write me no ugly letter. I ain't going to answer it. I'm not being critical. I'm just, I don't know how else to say it. That's why you don't hear hardly ever. 
And even with all the terrorism in the world, you find very little of anybody attacking Islam. Or the India religions of the Far East and, and uh, all those different places. Why? But notice Christianity. Now they're trying to figure out somebody didn't turn the uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper another way, trying to figure out to get Jesus to have a baby with Mary Magdalene. Always trying to pull him down to who they are. You see what I'm saying? So that tells you that we're right. That tells you we're right. Because we wouldn't have all in the hell that comes against Christianity. We're right. Satan is afraid of us. You see what I'm saying? So our father, that's who he is, who art in heaven, that's where he is. Hallowed be thy name. His name is equal to himself. Thy kingdom come. That's his mission, kingdom on the earth. Thy will be done, his desire, the blessing here. Brother Colton mentioned on the blessing. If the blessing's there, the blessing's here. As it is in heaven, no respect of person, here or on earth. Exactly the same. Now, that's the preamble to this thing. All right, now let's get into this. I want to deal with this. How do we, because I'm a man, I love to answer the question, how? People say, I, you know, I'm believing, uh, you know, believing God. How? Well, how? I mean, when and where? I'm, how, I'm a how person, a when person, and a where person. That just makes sense to me. When people say, you know, God's going to, go, God's going to do this. When? If they tell me when, where? They tell me where, how? Either way you look at it, it's going to come back to those three things in your life. I'm believing God for my healing. When? Where? How? Remember how people used to criticize years ago, not another how to series. Remember that in the Christian religious world? which was a shot against word of faith people. But well, bless God, if you tell people how to do something, it gets done. Preaching, proclaiming, teaching, explaining. What you proclaim, you got to be able to explain. And what you explain, you ought to be able to proclaim it. So let's deal with that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, how do we live out the will of God? Number one, write this out. Living out the will of God on the earth includes confession. Oh, I know that. Well, if you know that, how come it isn't working? No, you believe that. You don't know that. When you know that, you never forget not to confess the word. When you believe in to confess the word, you hit and miss in this thing at times. Living out the will of God on the earth includes confession. What you say is very important because it, it makes you what you are. You couldn't get married until you said something. When that priest or preacher, whoever you were married, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? You notice you didn't do this. You got to say something. If you go. No, 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 no. Even if you can't speak, you, you're going to have to say something. It's a confession. You don't go. No, no, no. Louder. You don't get saved unless you... Confess. You believe with your heart that he rose from the dead. So confession is vitally important. And I found that a lot of times, a lot of people have caused that to slip, including Jesse. Because I'll put myself in at times, I didn't say what I was supposed to say. And when I said something, I shouldn't have said what I said. So living out the will of God on the earth includes confession. Why? Write this down. You must never lose sight of the importance of faith. You must never lose the sight of the importance of faith. How important that the basis of all we believe is faith. Faith gives you heavenly ways of thinking, talking, and living. Write it down. Faith gives you heavenly ways of thinking, talking, and living. When you understand the importance of faith, it'll make a tadpole slap a whale. <laughs> it'll slap 
a tadpole, a slap away, or get your big ugly self out my face. Because faith is a now thing. Let me say it again now. You must never lose the importance of faith. People say, why do you talk about faith? It's the thread of the fabric of God's clothes all the time. Why are you so much into faith? That's how I got saved. It is my scientific fact that God exists. Write that down. Now, you see, the science can't, a scientist can't understand it. But when you understand Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's the scientific fact that God exists when you use the substance called faith. It gives you a warm feeling and a warm glow. As I had an atheist not long ago got in my face. He said, I don't believe in God. I said, there are no unbelievers after death. That's all I said. There are no unbelievers after death. He went. I said, what you blinking for? Since you don't believe it, why are you concerned? I can tell you concerned. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that. I could tell he was mad. Walking away. Why? It bothered him. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? So you must never lose sight of the importance of faith. Faith gives you heavenly ways of thinking, talking, and living. Me and Kathy, we live by faith. We live well. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm a blessed man. I have been criticized by the best. Because you see, if you're different, what people don't understand, they attack. Because they fear it. Say, and I'm different. You know, I, I'm a different man. I know that. And I thank God I am. Because there are a lot of boring people in the world. <laughs> And I don't mean that to be rude, but it's a boring. I go, good Lord, Jesus. Then I've seen such unhappy Christians. I talked to one the other day. I, 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 I said, why don't you just go to hell? <laughs> she said, look at me. I said, good Lord. Cause it, 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 you ain't having no, just go on to hell. Maybe it'll be better there for you. <laughs> she said, do I, I sound that bad? That's worse, sweetheart. I said, your problem is, is what you're saying and your faith is so good, it's coming to pass. <laughs> she's using confession, but she's using it in the wrong way. Now, you know, I, I'm a blessed man. I make no, uh, no, no, uh, you know, excuses for that. Kathy's building her home and boy, I tell you, we, we in an uproar in New Orleans right now. Lord Jesus. Oh, and people get mad. They say, I'll tell you, I don't like that house. I said, no, no, no. You love my house. You don't like your house. You love my car. You don't like your car. Because you, you're tired of driving that piece of trash you drive it, and you want what I got. See, that's jealousy and envy. So when people criticize something, I, I say, oh, no, you love what I got. You just don't like what you have. Oh, that makes people mad. But it's the truth. You see what I'm saying? So next time you criticize by something you may own, just say, oh, no, you love what I have. You just don't like what you have. And if I had what you have, I wouldn't like it neither. Oh, that makes somebody mad. But it's truth. And the truth will set you free. Are you hearing me? So watch this now. You must never lose the sight of, of the importance of faith. Faith gives you heavenly ways of thinking, talking, and living. Now, that means you can't think, talk, or live like a normal person. So you can expect some persecution. Because you're in the world, but you're not of it. People are mad at me because I don't go through some of the things they've went through. And they think because I got more faith in them or God love me. But no, no, I just listened to them and didn't go down that road. I mean, I'm in Butch's here, me and Butch good friends. If Butch would tell me, you know, look, when you come to my place, don't go land at that airport out there. Because they got a, they, I mean, they got a hole out the end of that runway that'll swallow the plane. It would be stupid if I landed in there and went in there. Why did I go into the hole? So, so a lot of, I've heard ministers talk, you know, different people who I esteem highly. And they said, boy, and I listened to that and I worked, and I checked it out. And I said, that makes good sense. I'm not going to do that. And then get mad because it didn't happen to me. Well, you the one gave me the information not to do it. Some people need to let the elevator go to the top. You understand what I'm saying? Good God almighty. Yes, it's called learning. Now watch this. The confession engine, write it down, of the word is where the power lies. Let me say it again. The confession engine of the word is where the power lies. Romans 4, 17. He called it those things would be not as though they were. 
If you haven't underlined that scripture in your Bible, you ought to double, put double stars on it. Because God called those things that be not as though they were. Abraham called those things that be not as though they were. And Jesse calls those things that be not as though they were. Why? It's the engine. It's the confession engine. Let me say it again. The confession engine of the word is where the power lies. Not possession, but confession. See, he, let me help you. You know what's wrong with religion? Christianity. I'm going to deal with just with Christianity. Christianity reverses everything God says. Christianity wants to possess and then confess. I say and I'm here when I'm sick. I am sick. I ain't dealing with your am sick. I'm dealing with your word heal. If I can get you to look at your word heal like you looking at your am sick, then your am sick will disappear with your word healed. Do you, does that make any sense to anybody? Now watch it. No, no, because they, they got to see it before they say it. But God never started that way. If you want to know how God starts, now if God called it those things to be not as though they were, and then Abraham imitated him, then the Bible says, be ye therefore what? Imitators of God as what? Dear, so we should do that in sequence, don't you think? Well, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, watch, in the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, okay? And the earth was out form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of the Lord God moved upon the waters. Watch this. And God said, what did he do first? He confessed. And God said, let there be light or light be. And God saw the light and he called the light good. Notice he confessed then he possessed. Religion switches it completely around and wants to possess instead of confess. That's what's happened to marriage today. We want to possess you before we confess you. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. It's called living together. We don't want to confess the responsibility to each other Till death do you part, and at times that can happen very quickly. You know that. We want the milk, the cookies. We don't want the responsibility of the milk, the cookies, or whatever is in marriage. So we come up with something that, that sounds phenomenal. It's one of these little contracts. To shut down the original contract or before you actually do the contract. In other words, you cannot have anything I have in the event we split. Do you see how twisted that's become? Takes the love out of everything. We want to possess each other before we confess to each other. Doesn't that preacher, that priest make you confess? Do you take this woman? This one right here. Look at me right here. Do you take her? Do you have a ring that's a sign of your love? Yeah. All these witnesses are watching. Yeah. Oh, this is a big confession. Because it's going to be recorded in the state houses of the government. As well as the, the grand house of God Almighty. Do you see that? But you see the church world for centuries... Immediately wanted to possess something instead of confess something. But God says you must confess and possess. Now you say, oh, I haven't been knowing that for years. And years. Well, how come you're not doing it? No, you've been believing it for years, believing it for to come to pass, but not knowing it. You know, people say, when, Lord? <laughs> when, Lord? <laughs> when, Lord? <laughs> when? Well, Mark eleven twenty four 24 tells you that. When? He said, what things soever you desire, Watch this. When you pray, comma. Believe that you receive, comma. We don't put the comma there. We put the comma like this. When we pray, we believe. When we, what things have we desire, when we pray, we believe. We believe. We ain't receiving. We just believe it. But it says when you pray, believe that you receive. Believe that you receive. Believe that you receive. It's one statement, not two statements. See, most of the time we believe it, but we're not receiving. Well, when the Lord get ready. No, 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 no. When you pray, believe that you receive. See, if you believe that you receive, you don't talk about it no more. Because you got it. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? 
The problem is this punctuation. We get in there and we put the commas where we want them. What things soever you desire. Not God, well, you know, you better ask if it's desire. No, no. He said, what things soever you desire. Come on, take the leap. Jump out. Ask God for something you want. Just take the leap. He says, what things soever you desire. When you pray, comma. Believe that you receive. What we do, we go, when we pray, comma, believe, comma, and when it comes, then we receive it. Ah. When, Lord, when you believe that you receive or when you believe that you take. You got that. Now, I want you to see that. Boy, I can, oh, Lord, there's so much here. Write this down. God speaks the future into the present. He says and he sees. That's Genesis 1. You go read the whole chapter. As I said earlier, you're not Im imitating Abraham. You're imitating God. So he says, be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. A person attacked me the other day about the size house I'm building. Well, we just don't think you ought to have that kind of house. I said, I don't think I asked you. <laughs> I said, do you believe the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1? Be ye therefore imitators of God. Well, yes. I said, let me ask you, do you think God live in a trailer? <laughs> oh, excuse me, a double wide trailer? <laughs> well, no, sir. I said, if you could see where God lived, what would you think? Do you think it be the biggest place in heaven? Would, would you think that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I said, well, my house ain't as big as God's, but it's close. Oh, it will be one or the other. All I'm doing is not living lavishly, living biblically. Oh, you missed it right there. You should have shouted. Jesus. Listen to me. I preached that the other day in my church. I'm not living lavishly. I'm living biblically. How are you living? People have been waiting for me to get sick for years and some of them are dead. God is my witness. Am I telling the truth, Kathy? What did you, you, you've been telling me since I started preaching. You don't slow down, you're going to kill yourself. They dead. I'm still here. <laughs> Pray for God to bless this Cajun boy. Bless him. They, God bless me, not with things, with the blessing, the ability to get the plural. Now they mad. Your prayer was answered. Not living lavishly. I'm living biblically. And I will not make an excuse for the scripture in my life if it's manifesting. Oh, Lord Jesus. God speaks the future into the present. He says and he sees. You're not imitating Abraham, you're imitating God. Now watch this. Heaven is nothing but blessing upon blessing. I'm not talking about stuff. That's the blessings. I'm talking about the ability. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he added no sorrow. It didn't say the blessings. People thinking stuff. Cars, houses, clothes, shoes. No, no. The blessing, the ability, the anointing of increase. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. Woo, Lord Jesus. And he added no sorrow. Why? Because you've got that blessing singular. You can get the blessings plural. That's why there's no sorrow in it. Because you are creating your future instead of someone else. I am the architect of my life. I determine the blueprints of this boy. Me. Do you get that? Heaven is nothing but blessing upon blessing. It's time to draw out of heaven and bring blessings to the earth. Years ago, I was afraid to do that and had the power to do so. I had the power to live better, but because of the fear of the church, of the Sanhedrin, I refused. I heard a lot of pastors say this, oh Lord, I'm going to get somebody mad now. I want to stay on the level of my people. Oh, you want to be a sheep? Not that you better, because you are a servant to your people. But you stay on the level of your people 
All you ever going to see is what your people see. And that is no vision at all. They got to be a shepherd. You got to Somebody got to be taking you somewhere. Somebody got to bring you to some place so you can grow to the fullness of the stature of Christ. But if you're on the same level as your sheep, you might be behind a big butt sheep that you should not be behind. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, sorry, Gloria, I uh, made a sign of the cross on that. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, I'm trying to get this over to you. It's not cockiness. It's not arrogance. Don't, don't miss it. No, no. It's saying that when God calls you to be a leader, lead. You must lead. You have to lead. What is everybody looking for in these presidential debates whenever you have, I don't care if you've seen one in 1956, you're looking for one thing, leadership. The next thing you're looking for is character. Leadership and character go together, man. That's what you're looking for. And they say that's who won the debate, the one that looked the best leader. Write this down. Living out the will of God includes Childlike faith. Oh, God. This is so simple you need a theologian to help you misunderstand it. Listen to me. <laughs> Living out the will of God includes childlike faith. What is childlike faith? Which is simply trusting what God says. When you children just trust what you say. We're going to take you all to Disney World or Disneyland, whatever. They run out the house. Run down the street with no evidence to the fact that you broke. <laughs> they saying we going to Disney World. or Disneyland or wherever you might go, Sea World, whatever, whatever, whatever y'all like to do. Man, them kids believe it. Oh, that's childlike faith. People say that. Oh, that that's just not. In, that's just innocence. Innocence is powerful. I wish a lot of people would be more innocent. We'd have a lot less crime. Think about that. Innocence is a very wonderful thing. Let me say it again. Living out the will of God includes childlike faith, which is simply trusting what God says. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 20. Man, I'm enjoying this today. I think I'm going to buy my tape myself. Okay. Lord Jesus, I got all kinds of stuff here. Proverbs chapter 20. Look what it says in verse. Let me just take this off here. Verse 11. Even a child, in Proverbs 20, verse 11, is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. That's powerful. Look at that. Now, Solomon is writing this. He says, even a child, uh, Proverbs 20, verse 11, is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. You know, and you know what? When a child thinks for himself, you call that child smart. And every child can think. Some just don't want to. I knew my, my mother and father, they did the best they could. And I, not, uh, I'm proud of what mom and dad did the best they could. But I realized that they couldn't give me what I wanted in life. Growing up as a kid, you know, that I knew that there was a word that I, at my home that I heard every day, work. Now, the difference between my mother and my father, my mother, my daddy didn't, if you work, you could do anything you want to do. In fact, my father one time told my brother, who was five years old, Wayne wanted, my oldest brother wanted to start smoking. True story, my oldest brother, Wayne. He's in Sturgis right now. <laughs> and daddy said, if you can buy him, you can smoke him. That's all he had to say, son. My brother had been smoking since he's five years old. Am I telling the truth, Catherine? I'm going to tell you something, that boy. And mama beat him. He said, daddy said, if I can buy him, I can smoke him. And he started smoking. God, this is the funniest thing in my life. I'll never forget this. He snuck out of the church one time. I mean, he, he, then he was about, about six, six or seven. And he went underneath the church. In New Orleans, a lot of times you have piers, you know, for floods. So you, so you can go underneath the house. But, and he was smoking. But there's cracks in the floor about this big. And the smoke was coming up by the pulpit. And some people thought it was the Holy Ghost. Look at the hotness of fire. That's a true story. True story. That happened. The beer is full gospel temple. I'll never forget that. And finally, mama said, it's that boy. He's smoking. 
And he's so, and he don't mind me saying this, he's so addicted to nicotine that he only has 20% of his heart working. And you know, he's had major heart attacks. All my brothers have, except me. I'm the only Duplantis ever made it to the 40s without a heart attack. And I'm in my late 50s now. Still, healthy as an ox. I give God glory for that. And Kathy helped me on that with confession. Now watch this. I'm telling you, he had a major heart attack. I'm telling you, they beat on him to, to get him come back. Finally got him, they said, yeah. And so he was in the room with all them tubes, you know, them bottles. So I decided to go see him. I walk in there, he ain't in the room. So I come in, I said, excuse me, did y'all uh, tell me that my brother is in room 24 or something? Yeah. I said, he's not, oh, no, no, he's, where is he at? He had got out of bed, took his bottles and his thing, and he was outside smoking a cigarette <laughs> with his bottles and intravenous. They like to went crazy. Oh, you crazy? He said, that was a good drag. <laughs> now that's ignorance gone. And Wayne, I don't care, that's ignorant. We've been hollering at him for years. That, but you know, he, he, he said, I've been smoking. You know, I said, don't make no difference what you've been doing. You can change what you've been doing. You see what I'm saying? But can you believe that? That thing got that much power that he walk out the hospital? Enough to die with needles in his arm, carrying his bottles with him? Sit down there going, oh, you know, it's a nice day. Now, it's funny, but it's sad. And I've seen him quit for nine months and then get mad and start back. So I know he got the power to quit it. You know, he said, well, no, I said, no, don't make an excuse for failure. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> See, what he needs to do is believe what's really inside of him, that he has power over that. That's called childlike faith. Now, let me say this. The world wants to break your childlike faith and offer you a distortion of what is truly good. Write it down. The world wants to break your childlike faith and offer you a distortion of what is truly good. See, the more in touch you are with the word and the blood, the more you're going to make the devil nervous. People ask me all the time, but Jesse, you live in hurricane country. So do about 10 million people. And all up the eastern seaboard is hurricane country from New York to Miami. All over the Gulf Coast, all the way down to the Carib Caribbean. You know, maybe they were, we're going to move the whole nation. But you see, me and Kathy learned something about the name of Jesus and the blood. What did I do uh, in June 1st? I called all my staff in at my office. There's one of my staff right there. Hey, girl, I didn't know you was here. How you doing? <laughs> in the prayer department, right? I thought, I said, praise the Lord. You get a lot of people. Sometimes you forget you get a lot of people. Didn't I call all the staff in? What did I do? I drew the bloodline, didn't I? I learned that from a good man in Miami called Stan. I call him Stan the man. I love Brother Stan. We drew the bloodline. We said no hurricanes are coming our way because they have to go through the blood. Now you got to take care of your own territory. You see what I'm saying? We drew the blood we, and, and the name of Jesus. And I won't tell you something that's amazing. And the only time in my life after Katrina, I've been in a lot of hurricanes in my life. I mean, good Lord. And, and the odds of getting hit by one are really kind of small compared to where the most damage is, is in the eye. Last time New Orleans was ever hit was 1965, Hurricane Betsy. Okay? But, you know, I didn't know nothing about that in those days, you know. But now we draw the blood. And when, when a hurricane did come, everybody said, you know, we ain't had one in a long time. Look like we do one. Well, here come Katrina. But 2005, August the 29th, 2005, boy, that baby hit, son. I mean, it was bad. Woo, Lord. I had a 140-mile-an-hour sustained wind in my backyard. Now, you think about that, son. That'll make a Baptist speak in tongues. I'm going to let you know something. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> you're going to pray in any kind of prayer, you're going to do something. And that ain't like a tornado. It got tornadoes in them. You see the tornadoes coming, too, with a 140-mile-an-hour sustained wind. And you got six hours of this mess. That's a lot of, and if it's moving slower, it can slow down, stop, just beat you, slap silly. But you know what? The only time in our lives, me and Kathy, she said it too. In 2006, we were supposed to have a greater hurricane season. Oh, God, is this going to be a bad of 2005? Well, we didn't have any. 
You know why? Because for the first time in my entire life, everyone in New Orleans said, we don't want no hurricane. <laughs> oh, no, 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 we can't. We don't want no hurricane. And guess what? The confession worked. We didn't get a hurricane. We didn't get it in the Gulf at all to hurt us in any way, shape, or form. But that's the first time the whole city of New Orleans finally got their act together and said the same thing. It'll even work for a sinner. I'm talking about living out the will of God on the earth. Mm -hmm. So let me say it again. The world wants to break your childlike faith and offer you a distortion of what is truly good. You see, because your natural mind goes against childlike faith. Oh, that's only a kid. Yeah, you might ought to listen to it. The more in touch you are with the word and the blood, the more you're going to make the devil nervous. See, I love to make the devil nervous. How do I do that? He never knows what I'm going to do. He can't read my mind, but he can inject the thought in my mind. But I tell Kathy all the, all the time, don't let nobody tell, don't show nobody what you're thinking, woman. Like when we go to buy something, don't get so excited that the price goes up. <laughs> when we go do business here, get that face and get solemn. When we do, we buy a car, don't go, oh, no. Because the car, you're not going to be able to cut a deal. You ought to see how good she is now. <laughs> Took about three cars, but after that, buddy, she got it together. Guy said, do you like that car? Oh, no, that's all right. We're going to go to lunch right now. This is what Kathy said. They said, well, you know, if you want to hold this car, you ought to give us a $500. Oh, just sell it. Don't worry about it. We'll buy something else. We'll go somewhere. <laughs> they don't want you to leave? Man, that's helped me greatly. <laughs> ah, that's called good business. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? He can inject the thought in your mind, but if you just sit there and go, the devil going. <laughs> then the devil start talking to each other. They get confused easily. <laughs> Satan's the author of confusion. The whole place is confused. They go, it ain't working. <laughs> How you know it ain't working? He ain't doing nothing. We're the only ones doing something. We're the ones talking about it. He ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Having done all the stand. See, that's living out the will of God. This is what the Lord said. So, if you bring heavenly ways of thinking and talking into this planet, it disrupts the devil's plans to steal your childlike faith. So, even when I go do business... I use heavenly and gospel terms. I used to not do that when I first got born again because I thought it wasn't proper in business tactics. But then I realized that God is the senior partner of everything I have. So I'm going to bring in his way of saying things and doing things. And it's amazing how they go, what did you say, sir? I said, this is what the Lord said. Like, I went to buy a car one time. I just walked on to the place. Uh, <laughs> I forget that. And the guy says, can I help you? I said, yeah, I come here to buy a car. He said, well, they're all for sale. Which one you like? I said, well, I said, let's, let's walk around here and the Lord's going to tell me. He said, who? <laughs> I said, the Lord's going to tell me which one, so I won't have to bring it back with a bunch of bugs in it and all that kind of stuff. I said, you ready to walk with me? Oh, yeah. When you're going to buy a car, they're going to walk with you. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll walk with you. I said, let's pray about it. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll pray about it. <laughs> He just put his head down. And you know, most people hold their hands like this when they pray. And I said, now, Lord, I don't know where, which car, what color. I don't really make that much difference. I just need a vehicle. And uh, so show me which one so I can drive it off the lot. And uh, I have to bring it back and about all kind of bugs and stuff like that. I said, you agree with that? He said, uh, uh, yes, sir. I said, say amen. He said, amen. I mean, I just, I just get, him, I get him tied up with it. And I stopped. I went, there it is. He said, did God say something? I said, he said, I said, you hear it? He said, uh, what did he say? <laughs> I said, that's the car right there. That's the one we want. I said, wash it. We'll take it. I said, and the Lord said he's going to pay this kind of money. He went, who? Who? The Lord make a good deal. I said, he's Jewish. <laughs> now, you laugh at that. That sounds stupid. I know it sounds stupid. A child like faith. But I bought it for that price. <laughs> my money better in my pocket than in this. And I never brought that car back once, ever. And all the time that I owned it, other than its maintenance, when it came time to change all, not one time. I don't go buy, I don't buy cars no more without God, because He knows which ones 
they worked on at the factory. That sounds silly. I know it. I know it. But that's childlike faith. That's living out the will of God in earth. I want it to work here, which is a lot of less stress and trouble. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, it seems stupid to the natural intellect, but oh, it worketh. So let me say it again. If you bring heavenly ways of thinking and talking into this planet, it disrupts the devil's plans to steal your childlike faith. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 13. I'm going to show you something here. Proverbs chapter 13. Now I'm talking about this. Living out the will of God includes confession. And living out the will of God includes childlike faith. Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. That's big. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. See, I talk a lot, but most of the time I don't say nothing. <laughs> oh, I can go somewhere. I can talk a lot, bless God, but I ain't going to say nothing. Why? Not, well, not, I, I, when I say say nothing, there's some things that should not be said. See, a lot of people say, boy, if you tell Jesse, it'll come out, it'll come out on the platform. Yeah, but because the only stuff that comes out is what anybody can hear. But I mean, real personal, private things. I got enough sense to know when something's real personal and private. You see what I'm saying? He called keep with your mouth. But if you open it up, you got destruction. You see what I'm saying? So if you bring heavenly ways of thinking and talking this plan, it disrupts the devil's plans to steal your childlike faith. Most of the time, the devil don't know what to do until you tell him. He's not a faith devil. He's a flesh devil. He cannot operate in the spirit whatsoever. He's spiritually dead. He can't tempt you in the spirit. You've never been tempted in the spirit. And, uh, prime example. Have you ever been tempted to tithe? <laughs> Have you? No. Why? Because tithing is a spiritual concept. He only tempts you in flesh. But you crucify your flesh, what, daily instead of Sunday? You don't fulfill that lust of the flesh. That's what the Lord said. He doesn't tempt you in the spirit. Have you ever been tempted to pray in the Holy Ghost? No. Why? Because when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're building up yourself. Praying in the Holy Ghost, devil don't want you to build yourself up. He can't tempt you. Here's something else. That's even, I don't know how many people miss it. I don't see how people fall for the devil's tactics when he, he just, good God, he can't do anything without you knowing about it first. What? They have no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Which means, if you don't know about it, sir, he can't use it. Because if it's not common to you, he can't use it. So why would you fall for something you already know about? How can you commit adultery when you know about it? What well, a devil stare at me. <laughs> Lie, you fry. Your wife don't even believe that. How do you think God's going to believe that? Now, people have done it. And, and it's forgiveness. You understand this forgiveness? That's not the issue. My point is this. Why do people make mistakes about something they already know about? Now, you know, if he, he pulls something that you didn't know about, that's a whole other ball game. But he can't even do that. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. God said he makes a way of escape. Most people don't want to take the escape route, but... It's just simply the truth. I've had many opportunities to fail in my life. I just don't take any. See, I, I think it's so funny when Satan tries to tempt me. It's a riot to me. He's a fool. I asked him one time, tell me something I don't know. He said, I can't. He doesn't know. He can't tempt you. I had two women beating on my hotel door in Oklahoma City at the embassy suites at about two o'clock in the morning. Say, we know you're in there, brother Jesse. We know you're in there. I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> so I called Kathy. I said, Kathy, I got two women outside the door. <laughs> They're beating on the door. Want to come in here? Don't call me stupid. Call security. That's what she said. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> we know you're in there, brother Jesse. We know you're in there. We come to minister to you. You think I'm kidding you? That's exactly what they said. 
Can you believe they use a godly term? So I hung up on Kathy. I called security. Man, I didn't put the phone down. It was Kathy. Are they there yet? <laughs> I said, yeah, they're taking them out, mama. Don't you open that door, fool. I said, I ain't open the door. You know, you're friendly. You're stupid sometimes. No, I ain't stupid. Why? Now we start arguing. I tell you what, my ain't stupid. What did they look like? I said, I don't know. I couldn't open up the door. <laughs> One time at the Shreveport Hotel, uh, at the Sheraton Piermont in Shreveport, Louisiana, the Sheraton Piermont Hotel, a hooker just come at me. Man, I, I thought, I, and I'm a friendly person. She says, hi. I said, hello. I mean, I know a hooker when I see a hooker. Would you like to have some company for the evening? No, I have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That's all I said. I just thought, you stupid devil. You think I'm going to fall for this, you idiot? This is common to me. They have no temptation taking you but such as common. This is common. She goes, oh, a preacher took off running. Tight skirt. That girl could run, boy. Ba -ba -ba. She's going down the road. <laughs> At the Sh Sheraton Pyramid Hotel. I never forget as long as I live. I call Kathy. I always call Kathy, you know. I said, Kathy, guess what? What? I said, a hooker approached me. She said, what? I said, a hooker. She said, I'm flying up. She flew up. Flew up the street pool. So she got out, I had a brick and mortar to the hotel, man. We're walking down to, get, you know, going down to the farm. She, and Kat, I'm just standing, I didn't forgot about the hook. Again. I'm glad Kathy came, you know. She goes, Is she here? <laughs> I said, Kathy can talk without moving her lips. It's amazing. <laughs> Is she here? I said, Is who here? The hooker. Where's the hooker? <laughs> I said, Kathy, I ain't looking for no hooker. <laughs> Look around, fool. She may be in here. She said that. I can't get <laughs> Now, the funny part was this. She's got my back. I ain't worried about that. I thought that was so stupid, so ignorant, that the devil would think I would fall for that. Uh -uh. I was born at night, but not last night. <laughs> Come on. Don't insult my intelligence here. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying here? It's called be ye holy for I am holy. And that's not holy. And I'll have nothing to do with things that are not holy. Someone give the Lord a good hand clap. You're going to fall. My God, my God. And glory, Sister Gloria knows a lot about healing because she has healing schools. Listen to this point. Let me close with this. this. This is just part one here. We got three other parts coming this week. And then I'll do something different on the night that I preach. Healing is in childlike faith. I find people that get it immediately is the ones that just go, okay. Healing is in childlike faith. As well as security, peace, abundant supply, and everything God has to offer. Let me say it again. Healing is in childlike faith, as well as security, my God, peace, abundant supply, and everything God has to offer. Yesterday, we were at service at our church. My little niece, now she would be my grandniece, huh, Kathy? Uh, Jordan. She said, Uncle Jesse, she's only about this big. Guess what? I said, what? She said, did you hear about us losing a transformer? Now, she's smart as a whip, this little girl. How old is Jordan? Seven, eight? Something like that. A transformer? She said, yeah. I said, you mean an electrical transformer? I don't remember any storm knocking it out. Somebody must have hit it. She said, and Grandpa, that's my brother-in-law, we played monsters with the flashlight. Ooh, we turned the flashlight on. Uh, and they were running all over. They were just enjoying it. And she was just telling me. She said, and Grandpa thought I didn't know it was him. How silly. <laughs> She's smart as a whip, what she is. And uh, Jacob's her little brother. I said, Jacob, did you have fun? Yeah, I did. I said, was you scared? Uh, yeah. 
I say yes and a no, you know. But Jordan, boy, I mean, you just ain't gonna get nothing over Jordan, son. Jordan's sharp. She's just sharp. And she had fun. She said, I like it when the Transformers go out. I said, don't say that. I said, we live in the New Orleans area. It's very hot. I said, you don't want to be too hot. The other day, we were in our good friend of mine's restaurant, an Italian restaurant. You know, we love, we have a lot of good Italian friends. Our blessings of the Lord. And this little girl was sitting there, and she's four, I think. Phyllis. Phyllis, a blessing of God, man. This kid is brilliant. Four years old. Talk to you like an adult. The phone rings. She's eating at the restaurant. She's at the table next to us. It's her mother, see? Now, her father owns the uh, restaurant. He's the chef. So she says, I'll take it. <laughs> so the waiter gives it to Phyllis. Hi, Mama. Yeah, Mama, everything's going fine. Daddy picked me up from school. Everything's fine. Everything's all right. You don't have to worry about nothing. I'm sitting here eating lunch. And then she must have said, well, let me talk to your daddy. And her father come out. She said, it's your wife. <laughs> it's your wife. Smart as a whip. Got the little Lord, got the Lord, I call it the little Lord Jesus Christ inside of her. She's a blessing, boy. She's sharp. She don't like things when it's hot. Her little sister is now two. She says, Tony, loves to go out. She don't realize it's hot. Go, Tony, go in the swimming pool. I'm staying in the house where the air condition is. It's hot. That's exactly how she talks, buddy. She you know what she told us the other day? Knocked our socks off. We went out and eat dinner with her mother and father. Well, you know, the kids cry, you know, when they leave. Well, we came back. Phyllis standing there. She goes, you know, I like you people. But you left me and that was rude. Did she say that? <laughs> she said, that? that was rude. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, Phyllis. <laughs> but your daddy made me do it. He's rude, too. <laughs> now, if they can pick up things like that, think about what they can pick up in the Lord. Man, their little brains are just cooking. Put, in the, put the fullness of the word of God. His will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. So healing is in the childlike faith. As well as security. Peace. Abundant supply. And everything God has to offer. So I don't know about you ladies and gentlemen. But I'm living out the will of God on the earth. That doesn't mean the devil don't fight me. But every time he fights me. Or comes at me. He comes at me with something I already know about. So I don't know. Why, why, why are you struggling with that? I won't have anything to do with that. that that's silliness. Because greater as he was in us than he was in the world. Did you enjoy it today? Yeah. Now, that's just the beginning. If you got your Bibles, turn with me again to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. We'll do a little uh, run back of what we said yesterday. In my sessions or my day sessions, I'll do something different when I minister at night. But in my day sessions, I'm, I'm dealing with living out the will of God on the earth. And so many people, they say, yeah, and it, but they don't seem to ever receive it. And one thing I'm, I'm into is uh, whatever God says I can have, I want it. I mean, that's not selfish. I just call obedience to accept and receive what he said we could have. So we'll go over a little bit of what we said yesterday. Then we'll get into some new parts here. Matthew chapter six. I want to read the very most famous prayer, I guess, ever recorded. In verse nine, he says... Yeah, glory to God. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is that my staff up there? What's going on? <laughs> Praise God. I know a bunch of them are here. Praise <laughs> y'all not. All right, y'all get a raise. I'll give you a raise. Praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, one, say they ain't listening now. It says, after this manner. Therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Underline that. 
as it is in heaven. So today we're working in two different economies. And what I mean by that, that what you do on the earth will affect what will happen in heaven today. What God does in heaven today will affect what happens on the earth today. The Lord said what you bind on earth will be what? Loosed in heaven, abound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Notice that. So that's walking and flowing in two different places all at the same time. And I said yesterday that when I said our father, that's who he is. He's not a father or some father, but our father. You can go over your notes. Who art in heaven, so you need to wear, know where your father is and where he is on earth. He's in heaven at the throne, but he's in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory on the earth. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I love that. Why? Because his name is equal to himself. You can't separate God from his name. You can't separate God from his word. So that's why I said, hallowed be thy name, because his name is equal to to himself, thy kingdom come. Now that's God's mission on the earth to establish his kingdom here like it totally is established in heaven. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's his desire. And what is that will? He said, to give you the blessing here. First thing he told Adam, he blessed them. And then he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish or fill the earth, subdue it. So in other words, God's main objective in life is to bless you. Now, church world for centuries have said he's here to correct you. He's here to test you. He's here to hurt you, beat you. You'll learn something. In fact, I heard one person say God will abuse you, then he'll use you. I heard that on worldwide television. I come out of my seat to my heart like a fellow. I couldn't believe it. And people were shouting about it. Well, most people I know that abuse children are in jail. Do you agree with that? Can you believe a preacher would say such a stupid thing? But they did. So his will be done on earth is his blessing, not the blessings, because that's the stuff, the blessing, the ability to receive that. And he says, as it is in heaven. What does that mean? God has no respect on earth. He's no respecter of a person in heaven. If it happens in heaven, it must happen here. So I, I kind of gave you that little introduction. And I talked about yesterday that living out the will of God includes confession. Now, see, and we talk about confession a lot in Word of Faith Circle, but we've, we've dropped a lot of it over the years. I can hear it by the way people talk. God called those things that be not as though they were. Abraham called those things not, that be not as though they were. And Jesse calls those things that be not as though they were. So I dealt with that yesterday, that living out the will of God includes confession, which means you must never lose or never lose sight of the importance of faith. Now, what the church world done immediately after the Lord told you to confess and then possess, they switched it. They want to possess and then confess. That's why they say, I'll not say anything about my healing till I get it. Are you trying to tell me to lie about my healing when, I, when I'm sick? No, no. See, but if you look in Genesis 1, first thing God said, he confessed and he possessed. God said, let there be light or light be. And God saw the light that it was good. If you go through Genesis 1, it's God said, God saw, God made, God said. In other words, he's calling those things that be not as though they were Till they are. In other words, he does not possess and confess. He confesses and possesses. Did you get that? You see what I'm saying? But the whole church world, the whole religious world, rather do it the other way. I'll say it when I get it. Like one person said, I am sick. I said, I'm not dealing with your am sick. I'm dealing with your word heal. Because if I can get you to focus on your word heal, you'll get rid of your am sick. I, I am broke. My Lord, if I can get you to focus on the God of blessing in the city, feel going in, going out. If I can get you to focus on that, your broke stages will quit. You see, but people don't want to uh, say it until they got it, which is totally contrary to the word of God. You can't live out the will of God on the earth unless you confess and possess. I don't care who tells you to. That's the way it works. That's the operational system. I dealt with that as the confession engine is, is the word or the power, uh, you know, the power that lies there is the engine of confession. Then I dealt with heaven is nothing but blessing upon blessing. It's time to draw out of heaven and bring blessings to the earth. What does that mean? You can move on a ministering spirit called an angel to do some work for you. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. They are servants. You are sons. You understand what I'm saying? You're in the family. There's a vast difference between you and an angelic being. You and the family, you're the only species that can sit down in the presence of God. Angels got to stand at attention, but he made you sit in heavenly places. 
I'm preaching better y'all shout. Listen to me. Do you see that? You're the only species ever created by God that can sit down in his presence. That's power. The only people sitting at the throne, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and you. Mankind. 24 hours, sitting down, everybody up. Archangels, angels, all kinds of angels, wingless, wing, whatever you want. The wheel within the wheel, all the stuff, the creatures, everything. Standing, but not you. Why? You family. In other words, everybody in heaven is working for you. So give them a job. You got that? That's the only way that this stuff's going to work here. Because we have to operate it from here. See, how can you do that? Well, the same way we send a signal to a satellite and make it do something. You can operate. You don't have to be in the place to make something operate. You just have to have the mechanism to get there. You see what I'm saying? To make it turn around, do whatever you want to do. It's the same way. Okay. Then I dealt with living out the will of God includes childlike faith, which is simply trusting what God says. It, that's so simple that it just drives the church world up the wall when you say, well, I'm just going to believe it and receive it. They go, no, no, you don't understand. Look, look, they're making you want to look at something that you could see, which is what is the devil's tactics. You realize that the devil, not a fake devil, he's a flesh devil. By the time he saw Jesus, he didn't know who he was. He had no concept of who he was. He knew he had some power, but he didn't know who he was. So he said, if thou be the son of God, I don't know, turn a stone into bread. Do something I can see. Flesh. Do something I can see. Because if you turn that rock into bread, you the man. <laughs> never ask him to do anything spiritual. Devil never tempts you spiritually. He only tempts you physically or in the flesh. I can prove that. I said that yesterday. Have you ever been tempted to tithe? <laughs> why? Spiritual concept. That's why people fight it so much. Because they're looking at it from a physical concept when it's a spiritual concept. So if you go through the temptations of, uh, of Jesus, you'll find out that it's all flesh. He cannot. Tempt, and then he, I said this yesterday. He can't tempt you with anything you don't already know about. So why would you fall for something you already know about? There's a scripture that they have no temptation taken you, which is such as is common to man. Or in other words, if it's not common to you, if you don't know about it, he can't use it. So to me, when the devil tempts me with something stupid, I go, you idiot. I know about that. I've had some people say, well, what, Richard, you never fell into sin. No, why? Because I know about sin. I lived in the sin world before I was born again. And you're going to try to tempt me with something that I went away from? That's like giving me a cup of vomit. <laughs> ah, you got it right there. I had to wake you up there. Dog return. Yeah, I woke you up there. I say, that's scripture. Dog returning to his vomit. You got to be living in a dream world. You think I'm going to commit adultery? That's vomit. Don't shout me down. That's vomit. I made it sound crude, but that's exactly what it is. It's amazing, man. People go, I just couldn't help myself. You mean to tell me you stuck your head in that cup? <laughs> and you knew it. Right. See, but childlike faith says, okay. Whatever you say, okay. So I dealt with that yesterday to give you a little update. And I said, you need to know what, uh, excuse me, that uh, when you understand that the world wants to break your childlike faith and offer you a distortion of what is truly good, the more in touch you are with the word, the blood, the more you're going to make the devil nervous. So the more you know about the word of God, the, the, le the less powerful Satan gets every day. You see, cause, watch this, because your weapons are not corner, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold, which means they're spiritual. He don't even know they're coming. You know why people are so against, you know why people are against prosperity? Because they have soul poverty, but they have spirit prosperity. Now, you talk about a life of Christian confusion is when you have spirit prosperity and soul poverty. Soul is the mind, the will, and the emotion. Your spirit is 100% contact with God. It'll do anything God tells it to do. People say, well, you got to develop it. It's already developed. Why? Because God lives inside of it. He's not going to live inside of a house with no doors and no windows. It's developed. Where, where the undevelopment is, is in the soulless realm, the mind, the will, and the emotion. See? So when you got spirit prosperity and soul poverty, you got trouble, boy. Because a prime example, if you go to a mall and you've heard me say this before and you see a person in a wheelchair, your spirit said, go over there, grab them. 
because you just come out of a believer's commission. Go and grab them in the name of Jesus. Rise and walk your spirit. Go, yeah. Your soul and mind say, control yourself, fool. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Kenneth Copeland, you living in a dream world? You're going to get a lawsuit here. That's soul poverty. Be not conformed, but be you transformed by the renewing of your what? Soul, mind, that you may what? No, not believe. No. That good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, because when you know something, there's no room for doubt. When you're believing for something, eh, there's some little areas that the devil can get in there if he makes you go by what you see. But when you know, you don't even blink. When Kathy goes to the mall, I know she's going to buy something. I don't even blink. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's what she's supposed to do. That was in our marriage vow. Do you take this woman to bring her to the mall? I said, yes, I, yeah, I will. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> she said, thank you. I'll kill you tonight. I said, all right. Glory to God. Now, so his will be done on living out the will of God on the earth. Turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John's right before 2 John. There's three Johns, but it's actually one John. There's actually four Johns, really. There's the Gospel of John and three Johns and one Revelation. First John chapter four is where I want you to get to. Now let's deal with part two of this thing. Write this down. Living out the will of God includes using the power within you. Living out the will of God simply means using the power within you. The problem with Christ Christianity and Christians, they are a bit lazy. They want God to do something all the time. It's like a child wanting their mama to always tie their shoes. If you don't teach your child to tie his or her shoes, they'll stick their foot in your lap when they're 40 years old. You've got to get them to use what's in them. You see what I'm saying? But a lot of times people say, when the Lord get ready. See, they're always waiting on the Lord been ready for centuries. For millenniums. And God is just sitting there saying, I can't believe he's saying that when I told him to go. Go ye. So let me say it again. Living out the will of God includes using the power within you. Now I'm about ready to read a scripture that people quote all the time because it's become so common to them they don't really understand the magnitude of that verse. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 First John chapter four, excuse me a minute, let me see here. First John chapter four, verse four, I'm sorry. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you. Now, stop right there. Meditate and concentrate on that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, we know who is controlling the world. Satan and his cohorts. Yet God said, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is greater than anything he can do. How come you're greater than Satan? Because, see, you, you are a spirit housed in a soul and clothed in a body. You can function in two different areas. Satan cannot function in heaven, but you can. Do you see what I'm saying? What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose. He can only function in this realm of sense knowledge. That's all he's got. You have sense knowledge and also revelation knowledge or spiritual know-how. For greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So when a circumstance comes up against me that seems insurmountable that I can't handle, I quote to myself, greater is he that is in you, Jesse, I make it personal, than he, Satan, that's behind this problem. Now, I'm not convincing myself that that's real. I know that's real. And my basis for knowing is my salvation. Because there's no way anyone in here can prove to anybody that you're born again. You don't have a contract signed by God that if you die, you go to heaven. But you can't tell somebody, if somebody say, oh, you know, you ain't born again, get out of here. How do you know that? You've stepped over into what I call Spiritual scientific fact. What I mean by spiritual scientific fact is simply living by faith. So you at such a degree that it irritates people when you say, I know. Who do you think you are? Well, I already told you who I am. I know. Yeah, but who do you think you are? See, they're trying to get you to bring yourself further down to where you are. 
But he said, great is he was in you. So, ladies and gentlemen, most of the things that happen in my ministry, I'm the one that make the decisions for them. I'm the one that do it and God just comes along for the ride. I said, let's have a good day today, Lord. Come on with me. What are you saying? Why? Because, see, that's why the father sat down. He has total confidence that Jesus and the Holy Spirit in you can handle the situation. So he's totally at peace with his decision to sit down. Oh, I said, let me say it again. Living out the will of God includes using the power within you. So you need to know that you have the power to stay on course no matter what. Write that down. If you have that power, you're going to stay on course no matter what. When Hurricane Katrina hit us, I knew, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I would be all right. Well, what would have happened if the place would have got destroyed? Well, I got insurance. Up. I mean, I can pay for it. I just don't want to. Re- I hate to pay for the same real estate twice. I'm not going to build a building I've already built. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll build something new, but I don't want to build something I've already built. Why? It's ever increasing. So you need to know that you have the power to stay on course no matter what. Now, how do I know I have that power? First John 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How many of y'all are born of God? Hold your hand up then you are an overcomer instead of a becomer. This is so simple. You need a good theologian to help you misunderstand this. Do you understand what I'm saying? For whatsoever, you are in that big word, whatsoever. Three words locked together as one. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now watch this. But he that, uh, uh, but, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now faith was given to you, not a measure, but the measure. So you already have victory. You just got to know how to get it out of you by using the power within you. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. This is so you can learn how to live in life or live out the will of God on earth. So when, I, when I'm walking, when I'm believing God, if I'm going to purchase a piece of property that's already mine, what? How can you purchase a piece of property that's already yours? Because Satan took it. Psalms 115 verse 16 says the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So when I went to purchase the, the, the ministry property, I said, that's already mine. He said, that's correct. He said, now, will you possess it? I will possess it. So I decided that I would pay my price instead of their price. Why? Because why should I have to pay for something that's already mine? But see, they couldn't understand that. So they, you know, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't donate it by no means. So I said, okay, so you want to you do business with me? You want to do business with me? Then we're going to do it my way. And the Lord spoke to me. You offer him this amount of money. My mind said, Lord, they ain't going to take that. He said, that's right. This all right. You, you don't want to offer Yeah, they won't. And it, whatever they, and anything over that amount, you pay for. That changed my mind real quick. <laughs> He said, offer them this. Well, I'll just give you an idea. They started out at $1.9 million for this piece of property. Me and Jerry Savelle were at Cobo Hall in Detroit preaching to catch the spirit of revival. And, uh, and i never forget this. Jerry had to go somewhere, do something. I went back to the room. And as I was driving back, the Lord said, when you get back to New Orleans, you buy that piece of property. I said, okay. He said, you offer them $335,000. You tell them you're going to be a Delta title at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Now, this was a Friday. I said, Jesus, the sign says I took 1.9 million. Are you going by what you see? No, I ain't going by what I see. How do you remember that sign? I don't know. It just maybe the devil put it in my mind. I, you know, 1.9. I figured, you know, maybe 1.4, 1, 1.3. 1, That'd be kind of cutting it good, you know. And I said, say that again. He said, you tell your attorney to call them and offer them $335,000. Watch this. Using the power within me now. $335,000. Tell them you're going to be a Delta title at 11 o'clock with a cashier's check for $335,000. You got it? He said, I'm not discussing this anymore. I said, fine. So I called my brother-in-law, Jules. I said, Jules, I want you to call the people that own this property. He said, you're going to buy that piece of property? Yeah. I said, I want you to offer him $335,000 and tell him I'm going to have a cash. I said it real fast so he wouldn't interrupt me. I have a cashier's check for $335,000. I'm going to be a Delta title at 11 o'clock. He said, Jesse. Jesse. I said, are you my lawyer? Yeah, do it. 
Okay. Now, boy, I mean, I mean, he can talk like a lawyer, too. So he said, he called the people and said, I represent Jesse the Plenus Ministries. Yes, sir, can we have, he would like to purchase the property. Oh, well, it's for sale. He told me to tell you that he would have a check for $335,000, cash your check. He would be a Delta title at 11 o'clock Thursday morning. Silence. They said, that's impossible. That's not going to happen. He said, I've been instructed by Mr. DePlanis to tell you that he will have a check for $335,000. He will be a Delta title at 11 o'clock on Thursday. He don't like to be late. They said, well, that's not going to happen. All I'm telling you is that Mr. DePlanis will have a cashier's check for $335,000. And <laughs> he will be a Delta title at 11 o'clock. Now, what was I doing? Greater is he was in me than he was in the world. I'm so glad he said it a bunch of times because it was helping me. <laughs> well, they hung up the phone. They, they, they laughed, hung up the phone. Ah, two hours later, they called back and said, tell you what we'll do. Since he's interested in the property, we'll give it to him for 1.7. I have been instructed by Mr. DePlantis <laughs> to tell you. And he started again. That, he got mad, hung the phone up. That was Monday. Tuesday morning, brrr, we have decided to sell the property to Mr. DePlante for $1.2 million, which is an ex just a phenomenal deal. I have been instructed to tell you. So he called me back in for He said, Jesse, they're going to sell it to you for one point two. I said, Jules. He said, I got it. Bye. <laughs> That's Tuesday now. Now, you see, what did I do during that span of time? Title search. What? Title search. I'm getting all my ducks in a row so I can pass that deal. Because see, when people that are sinners jump out by faith, they don't last long. So you got to get them a sign fast. So I told, I said, get down there and do the title search on that piece of property. You understand what I'm saying? He said, okay. I said, do it all. I want it all ready to go come Thursday. We, we close this sale. What's the point? And they said, suppose, I said, no, we don't have the suppose that don't work syndrome. You call Abby, Abby was the one that closed it, and you tell Abby to do that title exam, charge me whatever needs to be charged, I want them papers ready to go. So Abby called, she said, Reverend DePlan, I haven't even talked to the other party. I said, they don't need talking to you, they just need a check for $335,000. I said, Abby, I'll be there. She said, I know you're going to be here, but she said, do you think they're going to be here? I said, don't worry about it, Abby, they'll be here. I got off the phone, made the sign of the cross. Jesus, help me. God help me. Oh, Lord. Now I say, I'm learning, this is years and years ago. See, I'm using the power that is within me. God said I had it. Wednesday. All right. We have decided to sell it. And this is our last offer. We're going to give it to it. We'll sell it for $900,000. That is a deal. I have been instructed by Reverend DePlanis. Jules called me and said, I don't think they're coming. I said, well, it doesn't make no difference. You be there and I'll be there. He said, what are we going to do? Look at each other? I said, they are going to be there. I said, Jules, have I ever lied to you? He said, no. I said, do you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that I hear the voice of God? He said, I know that. I said, be there tomorrow. You got it? Okay, Jesse. Can we go to lunch? Yeah, we'll go to lunch afterward. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I walked in that office at probably two minutes to 11, and they were already there. <laughs> they were already there and frustrated mad. But I was in control. I'm the 800 pound gorilla. I'm the one with the check. <laughs> I made him an offer, he couldn't refuse. <laughs> I walked in. I said, are we ready to do business here? Yes, sir, I said, sit down. Abby, you got all the papers ready? Well, are you, you mean you've done the title exam? I said, I'm always prepared. Yes. I said, we'll close this today, sign it out, and give you a check, and we'll go on about our business. They said, Reverend, who do you know in Washington, D.C.? I said, I don't know nobody in Washington, D.C. Other than, I, I mean, I know the senator and the representative, you know, of our state. And, I mean, you know, I know the president like everybody else knows the president, but I hadn't sat down and had coffee with him or anything of that nature. Why? 
do you realize that you put the pressure on us? I said, no, sir. He said, we were going to lose this property at two o'clock this afternoon. The, go the government was going to seize it and we'd have lost everything. Well, at least we made $335,000. I didn't know anything about that. But I knew I had to be at Delta Title at 11 o'clock for the cashier's check. I signed, boom, boom. Of course, it's worth millions and millions today. What a blessing of the Lord. You see my point? Now, that, that's an example of using the power that's within you. Instead of waiting for God, oh, God. When God said, go, go do what I said. You see what I'm saying? Write this down. Problems always arise. Distractions always try to distract. Now, here's the key to that. Knowing that is half the battle. See, if you know that problems are going to arise and distractions are going to distract, you already won half the battle right there. You're going in with knowledge even before you start the battle. See, so I know what Satan's going to do because he has a track record of what he does. He doesn't come out with anything new. Do you realize something? I can say it in the Holy Ghost. I said, look, how did you learn that? The three temptations of Christ. The devil don't have four. He's only got three. Strike one, strike two, strike three. You out, devil. It's my ball. It's my bat. I win. I go home. He looks at Jesus, turn the stone in the bread. Jesus said, no. Why? What he was trying to get Jesus to do was to use the word of God for personal advantage. No, you're using the word of God for kingdom advantage, which happens to bless you personally. But you have to be kingdom minded. He said, turn the stone on the bread. No, don't use the word of God for personal advantage. He said, oh, you're looking for a kingdom? I got a kingdom. Let me help you with this kingdom. It's got money. It's organized, man. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's working. It's cooking. Do it like you want. You're kingdom minded. You're coming in for a kingdom. Hey, do it. All you got to do, just between me and you, ain't nobody got no nothing else. Just fall down and worship me. Just watch it, me. I'll let you run it. No. Why? He never would look at what Satan was looking at, even though he was kingdom minded. Let me say it again. Number one, never use the word of God for personal advantage. Number two, never. This is the second temptation. Never associate yourself with wicked people, even for the attainment of your end. You ought to write that down. If you want to be a success going somewhere to succeed, don't you link up a perfectly holy covenant with unholy people. You know why I like being debt free? Because I know where my money's going. But when I go to that bank, if I go to that financial institute, I don't know what they're doing behind closed doors. I don't know who owns it. I don't know how they're operating it. I'm not saying it's to send the, the bar money. Don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I like to be in the know. So I won't associate myself with wicked people. That's what Satan was trying to get. Look, just associate yourself with me. Ain't nobody gonna know nothing. I was just offered a political, a political uh, space at, 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 uh, oh my God, I mean, high people that had been fighting me for a long time, I was now asked to become their boss. Buddy, I mean, this was a powerful position politically in the city of New Orleans. They said, we're looking for an honest man. I said, I'm an honest man. You the man, son, you the man. I thought Kathy said, you ought to take this, Jesse. Take this, Jesse, take this. I said, I will. Because I, I'm, not, I'm not a politically person. I don't like, I, God called me to preach the gospel. But because of my television exposure, they know me in it. They go, oh, there's a revenue over there, you know. So, you know, and all of them become friends when it comes time to the elections, you know, with, you know, with all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but I don't use that, you know. I, that's, that's too holy to be used and just throw it around like that. But anyway, I was going to take this position. I said, Lord, what do you think about it? He said, I'll tell you what, after you read the book, let me know. I think the book, what book? You're talking about the word? He said, no, no. They're going to give you a book. I knew it. They gave me a book on ethics. Can you believe that? From the state of Louisiana, a book on ethics. <laughs> now, don't get mad at me. I'm a Louisianian. Now, the reason why y'all laugh so much, because Louisiana politics have been known since Huey Long, the kingfish. Okay? Now, watch this. So, it's not a very big book. Not a very big book. So they ain't a lot to cover. You understand? <laughs> they ain't a lot to cover. I open up the book. Now, I'm in negotiations in a business deal with this particular entity. Okay? I look at it, and it says this. If you're in a con contractual agreement with this entity, then you should not be on this board. 
then the first thing I thought of was how can the person that's the president that's resigning be on this board if, because he has a contract at the company that he uh, represents, has a contract or entity with this thing. How can that happen? Ah, he signed the contract. Either he signed the contract before he, he got the job or they didn't give him the book. <laughs> I don't think they gave him the book. Make a long story short. We read it, called the congressman. I said, I can't accept this position. I said, it would be unethical for me to accept the position. Why would that, Reverend? Man, he said, I didn't talk to everybody. I said, because... It says, if you're in a contractor agreement, you cannot hold this position. Oh, yeah, that's what it says. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. That ain't nothing. You the man. I'm telling you, man, you can really help this area. And I could. I said, but then I would become like every other Louisiana politician. Should I say it, Lord? Yeah. Running on family values and chasing hookers. Are you living in a dream world? Thank you. Are there any candidates out there that doesn't have sexual indiscretions? I wonder sometimes. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, when, you, when God is bringing you to a level, a position of authority in this kingdom of Satan's world, you better have all your ducks in a row. Because I know if I'd have took that position, it have went well for a year. And then it hit the papers. Did you know that Reverend DePlanis had a contractual agreement so he can move things his way and do whatever? And it becomes typical politics. But see, I used the power within me. What was that? The power of holiness. The power of doing what's right and not associating with anything wicked. That's what say the, the, the Jesus. He figured he didn't work. That temptation, sir. First temptation, never use the word of God for personal advantage. Number two, never associate yourself with wicked people, even for the attainment of good. And then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, well, since he's a word man, let's quote some word. Devil will use the Bible more than Christians will. He said, doesn't he say if you jump off here, that your angels will be sent down here, they won't even let you bust your foot. Well, then, well, never, never, wouldn't even let you hurt yourself. Yeah. He rebuked him again and said, no, why? That third temptation. You never perform a godly act in a prideful spirit. He did the same thing to Jesus on the cross. You call yourself the son of God? Why don't you pull yourself off, save me and save everybody else? And let's see how much power you got. Have you ever heard those preachers used to ask devils what their name was? Who needs to know what a devil's name is? Like as if that's going to do something for somebody. What's your name, devil? You'd have freaked out if you said Horace. <laughs> Rufus? Rufus? Got a devil named Rufus. <laughs> what, what street you living on here? I could care less what the devil's name is. Get out of here. Using the power within you. Let me say it again. Problems always arise. Distractions always try to distract. Knowing that is half the battle. See, so I know what he's going to come at me with. I did not accept that position. Well, you know what? Got a call back. Says, well, one thing we know about you, Reverend, you're honest. He said, but really, it's such a minor thing. I said, a white lie is still a lie. Yes, it is. Now, if I'd have done, finished my contractual agreements, it would have all been signed, and a year later, then I could have took that position without any problem whatsoever at all. Until the contract comes up, or the lease, or whatever you want to do comes up, then you're going to have to renegotiate that. But you see, I just read the fine print. They said, oh, but everybody does that. Well, uh, not me. Why? Because I have a standard that I have to live by. I'm not just representing me. I'm representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Do you see that? So if you want to live out the will of God on the earth, you're going to have to live like Christ lived on the earth. Did you get that? That's using that power that's within you. And you, the reason why you know because this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See, so God gives you not only... It shows you the problem, but shows you the answer to it. You write this down. You've got to get to the point where you believe the unbelievable, where you know you can receive what is impossible. You have to get to the point where you believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible, because everything God is telling you is not possible. 
I have over, well, not, not over, I have about $60 million right now of projects that I need to do in my ministry right now. And, and nothing wrong borrowing money, but I don't borrow it. So I got I to gotta have at least 60 million over just the normal operating budget. If somebody gave me 60 million today, I would be zero tomorrow. Can you imagine that? Bam! Just gone like that. Why? Because I'm ever, I'm always ever increasing, ever advancing. That's what the Lord told me. Go forth. Go ye. He didn't say come back, stop and rest. Go ye. Go ye. Go ye. Go ye. So I have to do that. I'm on a command, not a suggestion, but a command from God. So when I realize I have to believe for the unbelievable and receive the impossible. You follow what I'm saying? Now, when you begin to get like that, you really have to pull upon that power that worketh in you. Greater is he was in you than he was in the world. Everything I've ever done, I couldn't have done. When God told me to do something, I said, that's impossible. He said, that's why I'm God and you're Jesse. He said, because if I, if I told you to do something possible, you wouldn't need me. Well, that makes sense. You know, he said, you wouldn't need me at all. If, you know, if you, if you could just do it all. Well, yeah, I guess so. That's true. But there's times, a lot of times, I go to ask God about that and he shuts me off. He, he, he says, he said, I don't have time to mess with that. Handle it and whatever you decide, I'll back it. Did that shock you? Oh, 99% of all decisions made in my ministry, Jesse the Plans makes them. What? Jesse the Planets makes them. The Lord trusts me to make that decision. He'll back it. How many times you've heard me say, you, you pray, you pray, you pray to your animal spit in your mouth. You pray, Jesus, I don't know what to do with this situation. Would you help me, Lord? Would you help me, Lord? Help me, Lord. God, if, if you don't answer me today, I'm in trouble. And God has said nothing. Finally, you're going, do you hear me? I mean, I did that. He said, I heard you the first time you prayed. He said, Jesse, if I'm not telling you what to do, then make a decision and I'll back it. What? He said, if I'm not telling you what to do, then I have confidence in you that me in you will make that decision and I'll back it. Sometimes Kathy will ask me something and I just said, okay, do it. Whatever you decide, I'll back it. That set me free when the Lord did that for me. Now, there's been times I went to step out on something. He said, no, don't do that. Or go this way or go that way. Oh, oh, oh okay, Lord. But most of the time, I make the decisions. Why? Because Christ in me. I live for Christ on a 24-hour basis, not on a church basis, not on a believer's convention basis. You see what I'm saying? I really have a, I don't really, I don't have time to sin. I don't fit in hell. Hell, I'm like a square block going in a round hole. If I went to hell, it would cause hell. <laughs> It would. It's, get him out of here. Send him to heaven. We got enough to get him out of here. I don't fit in hell. Do you understand that? I don't spend my days and my or let my brain contemplate or meditate on junk that's of none effect concerning me. You see what I'm saying? I'm constantly moving, thinking, take it. So I believe the unbelievable and the impossible. Now, I'm a man of covenant. If I tell you something, you can take it to the bank. I'm going to do what I said. How many of y'all know I got my intercontinental jet? Well, do, many of you may not realize that I did not get the jet. I got the competitor. What? I got something that was just powerful. I went to do business and they broke covenant with me. They raised the plane $1.6 million. No, I ain't writing my partners and asking you to pay the extra. And neither am I. And I do business, I do business. I said, excuse me. That, do you understand what you're saying? Yes, sir. I'm not going to do that. We have a contractual agreement here saying that you're going to sell this baby for this amount of money. Now, if I didn't have the money, I could understand that, Dennis. But I got the money. No. Now my Tabasco sauce began to come up my legs. <laughs> I didn't want God to mess with this. I'll make him an offer. First thing I thought of was some friends of mine. <laughs> I got some good friends. Na 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 na. You think I'm kidding you? I'm serious I can be about that. Oh, and, and I thought. 
They can do some things I can't do, Lord. He said, shut that thought down. I shut it down. <laughs> when I walked out, the Lord said, they broke the covenant with you and they broke the covenant with me. Go over here. I said, God, I don't, I don't know nothing about that over there. And he gave me a statement that changed my life. He said, my direction for you is not always my destiny for you. Write that down. I said, what? He said, my direction for you is not always my destiny for you. Man, God's got you going like this. And you running, I mean, head on for it. You know God said. But every devil in hell is going there to shut you down at the same time. God does this. Boom! An extreme hard right, extreme hard left. And you wind up being better off than you were where you thought you were going. Because, see, he's doing business on the earth and in heaven all at the same time. And I came out with something phenomenal. And I flew that intercontinental jet. Brother and sister come sat and went, my God, you ought to see that thing. It's got Versace material in it. Oh, Lord Jesus. You can't drink a cup of coffee without your little finger up in the air. Jeez. Oh, Jesus. Now, some of you are going to write me an ugly letter. I have never used it personally. I can if I want to. But I have it. I don't have time. People say, well, don't you, don't you like to go on vacation? Listen, when me and Kathy get a day off, you know what we want to do? Go home. We, we like to go home. Because we're not there very much. We're by, well, we're in the process of building our, this final home. This house that I got upstairs is 21 years old. You walk up there. There have been people walk up there. Not long ago, this is brand new carpet. No, it's 21 years old. Oh, God, it looks brand new because no one's ever walked on it. We don't even give chances for roaches to walk on. We just, the spray man just kill them. They don't even have a chance to get on the carpet. Whoever gets this house, I'm thinking I'll go upstairs and say, Lord, when did y'all build this? Yesterday? But see, that's using that power within you. Greater is he was in you than he was in the world. And I, I thought, did I miss you, God? No, you didn't miss me. Are you uh, doing the vision that I called you to do? I said, yes, better than I thought. He said, you didn't miss me. He said, they just missed a big opportunity to make some profit. Then, if you don't think the devil's smart, I'm so pleased with this aircraft. I flew it to Jerry's place. Remember that? I flew it to Happy's. And one day I crossed the United States. I went to all my friends. Look at this. Did I happen? I did. I showed, I showed it. Did I? I said, Lord. I said, they told me, he said, you got to fly at least 10 hours with one of our pilots or, so the insurance will cover you. I said, well, can I do it all at one time? Well, yes, I guess you can. Come on, Kathy. <laughs> And then I paid the guy $700 instead of having to pay him $700 for every trip. It's that money today. I say, it's some money. It's called smart. Man, we had a wonderful day. I, 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 just, I just show it. I, I was so pleased. And you know what the Lord told me the other day? Watch. You must use the power within you. You like your plane, Jesse? Oh, God. What can I say? I've been to Moscow. I've been to Sydney, Australia, Brisbane. Oh, I mean, I've been all over the world preaching the gospel. Many of you partners gave to that. Man, me, me and Brother Colton were believing hard. Boy, I mean, believing hard. He'd look at me and I'd look at him and say, we're going to get these things. Yeah, we're going to get these things. It was just wonderful. He said, you like your plane? Yeah. He said, you satisfied? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to let your fate stagnate? I was about ready to say, yeah, I ain't going to lie. Yeah, this thing is nice. Vicky, uh, Vicky went in the other day. And I didn't say anything, but it a beautiful place. And they went, oh, Lord. I, yeah. He said, oh, so you've quit? What? He said, do you think I stopped creating? He said, check with the scientists. The universe is still expanding. He said, I'm on the move where you are. He said, you ever thought that you might want to bring a bunch of partners with you? I said, what? He said, Jesse, the plane's fine. That's not the issue. But don't let your fate stagnate. I said, God, forgive me. You want me to get something bigger? He said, I didn't say that. Did you say that? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to just make this announcement. My next plane will be a Falcon 900 EX. Then I'm going to a 7X. Then I'm going to a 737 board business jet. Lord Jesus. Oh, look, I'm going to do it. I ain't let my face stagnate on nothing. 
Now you think, and then I'm, I'm saying this in the plane. All right, Lord, glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, okay. Falcon 900EX, 7X, uh, 737 Boeing business jet. Now you're talking money, but it don't make a difference. God got a lot of money. It don't make a difference. We're flying back and we land in Ohio. Well, let me show you how much God's thinking. We land in Ohio, man. Get some fuel. As we taxi down the runway, we see a 747 on the side like this. Now, I couldn't see the side of the thing. I thought, it must be a Delta jet or American Airlines, you know, something like that. It's a 747 sitting like this would be the tarmac like this. It'd be like this. So I couldn't see the side. So I went up to the cockpit. I said, hey, who, 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 who has that 747? It shouldn't be stuck out there on the end of the tarmac, kind of cocked to the side like that. They said, we don't know. I said, call the tower. 770 Juliet Delta. We'd like to know. If it's possible, who owns that jet, that 747? They said a ministry. <laughs> now, without sounding prideful or arrogant, I know all major ministries. I preach with all of them. You understand? I preach with every, just about every major convention in America and in the world. I don't mean that prideful. I'm just, I mean, I know them all. I said, they said, but Jesse, a ministry owns that. I said, huh? And all I want is a 737? <laughs> Food, stupid, Lord Jesus. But my God, man, that's believing big. I said, call back and ask him what ministry. I'm thinking T.D. Jakes, Joyce Myers, Kenneth Copeland, Rod Parsley, uh, uh, the Baptist guys. Uh, <laughs> oh, I can't think of any names right now, but I'm, I, I preach with them. The Pope don't have a 747 that I know of. Ready for this? Grab your chair. They come, they said, Brother Jesse, Ernest Angley owns that plane. <laughs> Ernest Angley. You mean the guy that sounds like this? He. 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 I said, he got a 747. I turned my hand around. He. He. <laughs> Boy, you better get your brain thinking. He. Now, I'm, I'm not making fun of Mr. Angley, but Lord G, and he flies it to countries that they can't afford to pay for any of that. But he just brings everything. Ladies and gentlemen, if I had a 747, I could take this whole section. I could take this whole section. I could take that section. So how much it costs? Nothing. Get on the plane. Now, how is that going to happen? Is that the will of God on the earth? Yeah. Using the power that is within you. Amen. This is the victory that overcometh all this doubt. Uh -huh. First you think of, how are you going to pay for that fuel? <laughs> That's so asinine. It'd be like going by a car and say, do I have to put gas in it? <laughs> yeah. If God give you the plane, don't you think he'll give you some fuel? <laughs> You've got to get to the point where you believe the unbelievable, where you know you can receive what is impossible. I realized that I was so satisfied because I'm doing anything they want me to do, but he, he's not. That's stagnation. God's not one dimensional. I said that yesterday. You got it. He's all dimensional. He's spiritual, physical, and financial. Why is there such a thing called divine healing? That's why most people live. That's one dimensional. But there's something better than that. Let's go up a notch. There is divine health. Now that's two dimensional. Ooh, that's good. But there's another notch. He's three dimensional. There's divine life. And if his will be done in earth as it is in heaven, that's the third dimension. That he wants what's happening there to be happening in your business, your spiritual, physical, and financial affairs. Where the church world has made it one dimensional. No, everything is spiritual. No, no, no. Everything God does is not spiritual. What? No, God sometimes does a lot of physical things. He just wants you to enjoy yourself. He'll bless you with something. So he just watch you play. You know, I'm a little nervous about the children of the day. They don't know how to play. I'm really kind of concerned about it. I remember when I was a kid, go out and play. You can't tell that to a kid. 
today. Well, what, what, what are we going to do? I mean, you know, I don't know video games. Uh, how, many, how many of y'all remember when your mom and dad said, go out and play? They don't have any imagination. Well, I, I got to have a computer that costs $2,000. Uh, no, just go out and play. And I found a stick and play. I'd find a plastic horse and play with it. You see what I'm saying? I'm a little concerned about the kids today. You know, I want them to be blessed to misunderstand it and live in this 21st century, but they should never not know how to play. I mean, even cats know how to play. Puppies know how to play. <laughs> Children go, oh, you want me to do? Think. Just let your imagination go. See, go out there, look around. Have you ever seen a tree? <laughs> Climb it. Climb it. Kathy used to tell me when they would cut grass and they'd leave the clippings, they made, Kathy's phenomenal on blueprints. She learned it from grass clippings. <laughs> what? They would cut the grass because it's kind of thick, you know, and instead of bagging it up, people just let it rot. Yeah? Kathy and them would take it and build houses with the grass clippings. Okay, we're walking in the living room, and then we're walking in the... And that's how she can read blueprints better than some architects. That's called imagination. So when I saw a tree, my whole object was to climb it. I had to climb that tree. And my mama said, don't fall down and kill yourself. <laughs> Thank God she didn't mean it. <laughs> Throw a rope over a limb and just start swinging. Oh, 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 I mean, y'all remember Tarzan. Y'all don't even, kids don't even know what Tarzan is. They think Spider-Man. Tarzan, man. Tarzan. Tarzan was a man. Angawa, Angawa. Angawa, that come the elevator. Kid can't think that today. Boy, y'all remember the good old times. You? <laughs> you know, we knew how to play. We were using, you thought I was off the sermon. Watch this, how I swing this baby right back to home plate. <laughs> you were using the power within you. It just was in the second dimension called the physical. <laughs> Let me hurry. I don't want to take Jerry's time here. You've got to get to the point where you believe the unbelievable. So I said, all right, Lord, forgive me for my stagnation. Forgive me. Let's go where no man has gone before. <laughs> all right. All right. So if you ever come to my office, you go up to the executive offices on the second floor. I have four beautiful airplane pictures that are beautifully framed in gold and gorgeous and it's my first citation which now Reverend Happy Caldwell is flying all over the place who that happy so everybody say I watch it and I got a statement of where I began and then I have another picture of my, uh, the other I've owned three jets uh, of the uh, what's that the West Wind 2 where I used to be and I got a picture of my intercontinental jet today fucking today, where I am. Then I got a picture of the Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> Frame where I'm going. That's on the wall of my offices. Look, I hooked up with Kenneth and Jerry and Creflo and Gloria, and they're going somewhere. And I go out there and I look at that. But one day there'll be a picture of a Falcon 900X and a picture of a 7X. Ooh, that's 7X. <laughs> then a picture of a 737 Boeing business jet. And then there's going to be a picture of me. Heel. <laughs> I got the revelation on that man. 747, 777. Jesus. Maybe the space shuttle. I don't know. It sounds crazy. Yeah. 
If people would not have believed what I am saying in the second dimension, the physical, we wouldn't have half the stuff we have today. Do you know 15 years ago you couldn't only find a person with a cell phone? Oh, you can't have no cell phone. Text messaging. Kathy, she's still mad at me. Why don't you join the 21st century? Why don't you put your phone on? I said, if I want to talk to you, I will call you. <laughs> oh, she get mad as a haunted about that. As soon as I finish, I cut it off. Well, suppose we, we can't get a holy. I, well, that's all right. I have pilots. You can find me. Why? Because I got to think. What? I got to think. I got to hear. It's more important to hear the voice of God outside the church than it is to hear it inside. The wealth of the sinner is not in the church, it's outside the church. To get it inside the church, you gotta hear. I gotta think. So I get on that plane. Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost putting these things. Come on, let me show you something. Man, God, that if I say if I said that, they think I'm crazy. They think you're crazy already. Come on. You're going to stay in the boat with religion and only meet disciples or you're going to get out on the water and walk with me. Use the power that's within you. And I'm saying, okay, God, do it. No, no, you do it. See, that's growing to the fullness of the stature of Christ. I'll say this in close because I won't take Jerry's time. The Lord dealt with me on the plane the other day. He said, too many people dying. I said, what's about heaven getting full? Something wrong? <laughs> it's reasonable. He said, no, they're just dying the wrong way. He said, I'm going to start giving you some messages on how to die. I said, is this a prophecy? <laughs> he said, no. He said, death and life's in the power of the tongue. Not in the power of cancer or diabetes or high blood pressure or even old age. He said, you know what? You can't believe what you haven't been preached. Has any of y'all ever heard of a sermon on how to die? I haven't. Because we don't ever preach that. Well, how do we expect people to have faith when it comes to that time or what to do with that situation? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We got to cover some of these subjects here because you see, it's appointed that a man wants to die. So we got to know how to have a good death if Jesus tarries and we go by the way of the grave. We got to know how to handle that. We know how to accept Christ as Lord. We saw it last night in the altar call. Well, how do they know that? Well, we've taught people how to accept Christ as Lord. See, so if Jesus tarries and we all go by the way of the grave, we're going to have to know how to do this and how to do this correctly since we're believing the word. That may sound nuts. But it isn't nuts when somebody's at that point. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. They that love it, love what? Whatever they say, shall eat the fruit thereof. Ha. Ha. He said, I don't mind having my kids with me, Jesse. But they didn't finish their destiny or reach their destination. They were throw a roadblock called disease. He said, because nobody's ever preaching on any of it. Notice when Brother Copeland started preaching on prosperity. What happened? Well, that was a prosperity revolution, wasn't it? How many of y'all got that book called The Laws of Prosperity? Remember that? Lord Jesus, man. I remember when I first preached with Brother Colton, which was 17 years ago, you couldn't find hardly find a preacher with an airplane. Much less, a, they were just barely getting to the point of a new car. Y'all remember that? But all of a sudden, Brother Colton had enough guts, gall, and audacity to believe the unbelievable and to receive the impossible. Well, bless God, you can have a plane. Oh, man, I got trouble filling up a Toyota. Huh? I'm going to have a plane. Jesus. But they start preaching it. What happened? Dennis got a plane. Happy got a plane. I got a plane. But Copeland got a plane. Mac, you got a plane, don't you? I don't have a plane. How many planes? Jesus. All of a sudden, you go to the minister's conference, we're having problems parking planes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Mike Barber said he go, he's receiving one. He's getting one. Why? Wow. You know, what, what happened? Somebody began to preach it and took the heat from it. Do 
You see my point? He used that power within him. And some of the word of faith God said, a little too strong. Kind of going over the hill there, Brother Copeland. <laughs> he said, that's what I'm trying to do. Fly over the hill. That's what I'm trying to get. I'm, 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 so I can go and complete this gospel. Because that's all it's for. Living out the will of God includes using the power within you. Did you enjoy it this morning? Yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap. For that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've been teaching and preaching in the day sessions on living out the will of God on the earth. And as you turn into Matthew chapter 6, we'll start reading again that very famous prayer, verse 9. Let me just say this. When I get to heaven, I don't need no money. I don't need no healing. I don't need any extra love to love somebody. I don't need any of that. I need all that here. And when Jesus began to speak, he said such powerful things that seems so impossible, but he figured we could do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Our Father, after this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. Underline that part of this passage. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So I said in part one and part two, this is part three now, that we cause things to happen in heaven today because we're working in two economies all at the same time. We're working in the earth and we're working in heaven. What we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So notice you have power in both planets. Planet earth, planet heaven. God is also living in heaven and on the earth, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you will do something today that will cause some kind of something to happen in heaven. And then heaven will do something in heaven that will cause something to happen on the earth for you today. Because we're family. We're in the body of Christ. Now, I just go over this real quick. Our father, so that's who he is. He's not a father or some father, but he's our father. Who art in heaven, that's where he is and where he is inside of you. Hallowed be thy name. I told you that his name is equal to himself. You can't separate God from his name. Thy kingdom come, which means the mission on the earth, which will produce the mission in heaven. His will be done in earth. His desire, the blessing that's in heaven, be here. And God's not one dimensional. The church world preaches God as one dimensional. When they read the Bible, they only think of him as spiritual. That's a spiritual concept. No, he's spiritual. He's physical. He's financial. He records all of that in scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Shows you what to live, how to live, where to live. And he does that through that mission. His will be done in earth. So his desire is to be a blessing. How do I know that? First words he said to Adam, he blessed them. He empowered them to prosper. He says, as it is in heaven, God has no respect to persons on the earth or in heaven. Now, we dealt in part one. I'm going over this. Some of you are looking at your notes. I dealt with living out the will of God includes confession. But I told you that for 2,000 years, the church never did like confession. They like possession. Brought you to Genesis chapter one. The Bible says, and God said, light be and light was. Notice he confessed, he possessed. But the church world likes to possess and then confess. And that's perfect in the healing realm. I will not say I am healed when I am sick. When we're not dealing with your am sick, we're dealing with your word healed. So if you focus on your word healed, you'll get rid of your am sick. But you're trying to possess something before you confess it. Well, I'll say it when I got it, which is totally contrary to the word of the Lord. So that's not living out the will of God on the earth. I dealt with that. And also living out the will of God includes childlike faith, which is simply trusting God. Childlike faith. 
Well, you don't become homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theological. That you start making debates instead of making decisions. We dealt with that in, in part one also and part two. Then we dealt with in part three, living out the will of God includes using the power within you. I mean, y'all want the will of God for you today on the earth like it is in heaven. That means you ought to be debt free, blessed, beyond debt free. Have to have a hard time to get sick because there's no sickness in heaven. And God expects us to believe that greater is he is in us than he is in the world, which means this. It's time for us to grow up and do the stuff he wants us to do instead of waiting on God to do something. Just like you tell your children, you teach them to tie their shoes. You send them to school to be educated. You see what I'm saying? And they may not want to be educated. I don't want to go to school, boy. I'm not raising an idiot. You're going to school. See, so you make them learn. And a lot of Christian people are still waiting for God to do something when he says, I gave you that power, so go out and do it. So we dealt with that in part two. Now I want to deal with this today and write it down. Living out the will of God includes throne time. Living out the will of God includes throne time. Go with me to the book of 1 John. It's right before 2 John. Chapter 1, verse 3. Living out the will of God includes throne time. Now I said this and I'm going to say it again. Throne time is not church time. Church time is school time. Church is where you learn about God. So you can do his will, his commandments and his statutes. People think just because they went to church, they spent time with God. No, you spent time with the teacher of God, which is your pastor. Or if you're going to a special meeting. Working with God and spending time with God is totally different than church time. You may feel his presence in church. You may shout in church. You may holler in church. You may run in church. You may give in church. But that's not throne time. That is school time. A lot of people say, you have such a unique relationship with God. I spend time with him. I say, what are your aspirations, Lord? You notice that you don't ask that to God in church. You're learning about God in church. That's school time. First John chapter one. And John, the beloved, could really express this in verse 3. He says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. fellowship. With us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This was the closest disciple to Jesus Christ, John. He handled him in a sense. Hold your place right there and go over to Revelations chapter 1. And look at this phenomenal verse of Revelations chapter 1. Now you got to realize as you're turning to Revelations chapter 1 that John was on the road with Jesus, ate dinner with Jesus, rode donkeys with Jesus, went to preaching meeting with Jesus, slept in the same house with Jesus. You would think he would know Jesus. You would think, certainly, if anybody knows the Lord Jesus Christ, it's got to be John the Beloved. But notice the expression of his writing in Revelations when he's on the Isle of Patmos. Because he said, not only must you read the Word of God, and you might want to write this down, you must also look for the expression of how they wrote that Word. The expression or the sensitivity of the Word he used to express and you can get it through our writing without even having to hear it physically. You can hear how they talk. And if you truly get close to the word of God, you can hear them talking. You see, I have a lot of people, a lot of times they say, well, Jesse, when I'm reading your book, I hear you talking. Is that correct? I hear you talking. Why? Because, see, I'm expressing myself, whether it's by pen or paper, or in person like it is today, but you're hearing me with your ears. But you see, I can, I've heard the Apostle Paul's voice. I've heard the, the beloved John's voice because I hear him talking 
in his writing, not just reading his writing. Now watch this when he sees Jesus, because he's never seen Jesus like this before. And he saw him transfigured, which is about as good as it gets on the earth. But you see what happened was in Revelations 1 verse 10, John writes, I was in the spirit. How many of y'all ever been in the spirit? All right, now you know what I'm talking about. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Notice when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He had never seen Jesus like that day. As you hear him, he says, I saw him high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Now that is fellowship time. That's not school time or church time. This is time now to say, hello, Jesus. Hi, Jesse. And I like to kind of know what God's thinking Beyond, hang on, I'm going to make some theologian mad. Beyond what he wrote in the book. For lack of a better way of saying it, I, I, else I can say it, I can only say it in the natural. How do you feel today, God? You see, I've known God so good. And I fellowship with him so much in my throne time. I know when he isn't feeling right, for lack of a better term. Prime example. Not long ago, and that's happened many times, I went into my study to do a daily devotion or whatever, just to talk to the Lord, and he just wasn't acting right. <laughs> Am I shocking you? I will shock you if you don't have throne time and you've just been to church time. He was not acting right, Butch. I know God. He wasn't acting right. So I said, Lord, I need to ask him, something wrong? You ain't acting right. He said, yeah. He said, you know me. I said, yes, I do. I said, what's the matter, Lord? He said, my people have disobeyed me today. I could sense it that he was hurt. I could sense that. He said, they disobeyed me today. See, you can hurt. You know it when you've hurt your parents or you've hurt your children. You know it. You can tell when somebody has been hurt in some way, shape or form. I said, Lord, what's wrong? He said, because yeah, I know the Lord. I know how he laughs. I've heard him laugh. I've heard him talk. I, 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 he's told me secrets. Stuff that's not even in the book. Oh, that just makes preachers mad. I don't care. <laughs> if you went up there, as much as you go to church, he might tell you something. That's called throne time. I want the will of God on the earth. Not when I get to heaven, so I don't act like an idiot when I get to heaven. I said, what's wrong, Lord? He said, my people have disobeyed me. I said, Lord, I'm going to cancel all my appointments today and I'm going to sit here and praise you and I'm going to glorify you. I don't know how to say it, but for lack of a better term, Lord, until you feel better. I said, listen to this, God. And I started praising him. Wow. I start calling his name. You are magnificent. Oh, honorable. And I heard the Lord go, whew. Jesse, you make me feel good. I said, I got some more. Listen to this. I just begin to bless him. He blessed me. I can return the favor. How do you, can you do that? In Christ, the hope of glory. I mean, I ministered to the Lord. I blessed him. Because he was hurting. Let me ask you a question. Have you heard him today? Well, you can tell when it hits. <laughs> People go, <laughs> <laughs> you know if you did. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, thank you. He said, you can go do your appointments now. I appreciate that. I said, I just, I just want to let you know, you can count on me, God. You got, you're having a tough call on Jesse. <laughs> Boy, that sounds arrogant. Oh, I know. I bet you'd make somebody mad. Because, see, you've never had throne time. You've had only church time. Now, when I have throne time, I don't have a prayer meeting. Throne time is not designed for you to have a prayer meeting. 
Write that down. A prayer meeting is asking God to do this and all that kind of stuff. He don't mind, but he just likes to talk sometimes. I asked him one time in my throne time. Some of you have heard me say this. I said, I, I, I got to ask you a question. He said, what? I said, you have forgiven me of all my sins. He said, that's correct. I said, but you said there's a scripture in the book of Hebrews kind of bother me. He said, it bothers you? I said, yeah. What? I, he said, what's that? I said, you said if we willfully sin, there remain no remission of sin. He said, that's exactly the truth. I said, well, I, that just messed me up. He said, why would you say that? Jesse? I said, I willfully sin. He said, no, you haven't. I said, yes, I have. He said, no, you haven't. I said, I'm telling you, Lord, you may not have forgot about it, but I have. <laughs> you know, I know you blot these things out, but I'm going to tell you something. I mean, I have. He said, no, you haven't. I said, I have it. He said, no, you have it. I said, what did I do? He said, you, you've never sinned by yourself. I said, what? He said, you've never sinned by yourself. You always had someone to help you. I said, well, since we're talking, this is a throne time. See, this is just talking now. This ain't praying and asking for this and that. This is throne time. I said, did you love Lucifer? He said, I really did. Made him a praise angel. He's right next to me. He said, you talk about a good looking angel? He said, I did my best in them. I said, you did. He said, when he walked, music played. He said, I put it in the scripture that tap rats were put in him. Whew, can you imagine just walking and music coming out of you? You ever walk by somebody that has a wonderful perfume? You go. <laughs> Maybe I'll turn you around. You can just you, you, you fill up a place, the fragrance. Yeah. I said, well, you know, why didn't you make a plan of redemption for him? I think that's a legitimate question. You made a plan of redemption for me. You made a plan of redemption for us. Since you loved him and put him at that high position, why, did, why didn't you make a plan of redemption for him? He said, because he willfully sinned. I said, Lord, you may not remember, but I think I willfully sinned. He said, no, you haven't. I said, I haven't. He said, no. I said, that's when he said, again, he said, you never sin by yourself. He says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth what? Sin. When sin hath conceived or finished, it bringeth forth what? Death. He said, you see, Jesse, you've never willfully sinned. I haven't. I thought I did. I thought I just disobeyed you when you told me to do. He said, no, you had a tempter. Drawing you and pulling you. He said, Satan never had a tempter. Never. He never had anybody pulling him to do something wrong. He said, I will exalt myself above the most high God. I will sit in the congregation of the north. Nobody ever told him to do that. See, that's the difference. That's willful sin. He said, everyone that's ever sinned had a tempter. Satan did not have tempter. That's why I did not make a plan of redemption for him because he willfully sinned. I said, that's good. I said, that answers the question. He said, that's correct. I said, I have never willfully sinned. He said, that's correct. You either had, you always had a devil pulling on you or your flesh pulling on you. He had none of that whatsoever at all. He simply made a conscious decision to come against God Almighty. Isn't that good? You see, you learn things like that at throne time, not church time. Church time is how to work the works of God on the earth. School time, educated in the things of God to complete the mission of God. But throne time is just you and God and whatever y'all decide to talk about. Right, just now. When you visit the throne, you won't come back with conflicting ways to deal with life. You come back with the mind of Christ, and that's a clear thinking mind. Let me say it again. When you visit the throne, you won't come back with conflicting ways to deal with life. I find so many Christians have conflicting ways to deal with life. Why? They haven't been at the throne. You come back with the mind of Christ, and that's a clear thinking mind. 
And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind or your soul. That you might know, not believe, but that you might know that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So when I go out to do something, I've come back from the throne. I won't be honest with you. I mean, he, God may tell me to do something impossible. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to do with God because I'm not conflicting in my, my train of thought. This is what he said. And I don't even have time to doubt it. Because you see, the more you spend at the throne, the less you spend... Learning how to doubt. You see what I'm saying? That's why if Jesus tarries, I'm going to have a good death. Huh? I'm going to have a good death. What do you mean a good death? A good death with Jesus. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. A good death was Brother Kenneth Hagin. Think about that. He always said, he said, you know, when I get satisfied is when I'm going. He said, I believe I'll have a little breakfast, eat dinner, sit down, go home, be with the Lord. That's exactly what he did. Now, nobody wanted him to go, but ain't none of our business. That was between him and, bro and Brother Haggard. And that's, that's called a good death. An honorable way to leave this planet before the rapture of the church. Now, some people don't believe in the rapture. Stay here. <laughs> You're welcome to stay. Do what you want to do. You'd be stupid if you did, but I don't mean that to be rude, but stay. You want to go through the tribulation? Go ahead. Enjoy yourself. Well, what you going to be doing? Eating dinner? I'm going to marriage supper of the Lamb. You understand? You want to stay here? Get yourself kicked all over the place. Enjoy yourself. Oh, I'll be back. Probably to bind up your wounds. Hmm. When you visit the throne, you won't come back with conflicting ways to deal with life. You come back with the mind of Christ. That's a clear thinking mind. Notice I don't have a prayer meeting with the Lord. I never ask the Lord anything that I never ask him for anything during my throne time. I just talk to him. What do you think about this? I've had the Lord say, what are you sensing today? I say, you trust your spirit in me, don't you? I said, he said, yes, I do. He said, what are we going to do today, Jesse? I said, you don't know what you're going to do, Lord. He said, you my hands. You're my feet. You're my mouthpiece flying back from Russia. I just finished preaching for Rick Renner. We had a wonderful time. Blessing of the Lord. It was our first intercontinental trip on our, on our new jet. I was so excited. My Lord, that's a long trip coming back to America, you know. So, uh, you know, and, and so I'm just sitting there and I just is thanking the Lord. I'm walking up and down that plane. Lord Jesus, you bless. I just thank you, you know. And I, and I thought, man. I'm going to have some throne time here. I said, you know, Lord, let me just tell you how I feel. He said, how you feel? Now, this is how I talk to God. I don't know about you do. I don't go, almost gloriously heavenly for the God. <laughs> I learned that at church. At school time. I said, Lord. He said, what? I said, you've brought me all over the world. And he interrupted me. He said, no, I haven't. You've brought me. I said, what? He said, Jesse, I didn't bring you to Moscow. You brought me. What did you do when you were in Moscow? I said, I preached about you. He said, you see, everything you do is my work. I didn't bring you. When I sent you to Africa, when you went to Africa, you brought me. Everything you did, I was wrapped up in it. He said, thank you for bringing me to the world. See, you got to think different. You don't know that until you spend time with it. I said, uh, well, you provided the way. He said, no, you did. I didn't. You planted the seed. It's the seed that gets the harvest, Jesse. It's just the byproduct. of the, You're the one that did that too. All I did was act on my word that if you'd sow a seed, I'd give you a harvest. So if you wouldn't have sowed the seed, he said, we'd be in Louisiana right now. <laughs> You're the one that did that too. He said, I'm proud of you. I said, how did I do at Lennon's tomb? He said, whoo, you shook him up. <laughs> I couldn't get over that. Me being in Red Square at Lennon's tomb. Lord, who would have thought? My Lord. See, write this down. Whether you're working hard for God or hardly working at all, you need to visit the throne. Let me make it even simpler. Let me say it again. Whether you're working hard for God 
or hardly working at all, you need to visit the throne. What is throne time? Definition, in the cool of the day, God would come and talk to Adam. What did they talk about? You ever wonder what they talked about? Think about that. You think God was giving him instructions? Uh-uh. He just talking, how y'all doing? Now, he told Adam to keep, when he put him in the Eden, keep it and dress it. He gave him a hint, keep it, which means you can lose it if you don't keep it. Also, dress it, which means it wasn't finished in creation because it wasn't perfect to God's man and woman put their hand on it. They had to dress it. When my daughter was born, 1971, at 1206, on October the 25th, 1206, 1971, she came into the world naked. You know what I did? I dressed her. I had already been to the store and bought a dress. Now, she looked good naked because she's a pretty baby. A little hunchback nurse. I'll never forget that hunchback nurse. I ain't know it. I ain't know it. I'll never forget that hunchback nurse. But that woman knew her business. She said, that's one of the prettiest babies I ever saw in my life. I said, thank you, ma'am. She said, I don't know how you ever had made a baby that pretty. Now, you got to understand what I look like. Long chocolate brown hair down the here. Bell-bottom pants, you know, puffy sleeves, you know, sideburns all the way down the here. I don't know how you ever made a baby that pretty. I said, I don't know how you ever got a job in this hospital. <laughs> she said, I know what I'm doing. I said, I know what I'm doing. Look. I said, put this dress on her. Who picked that dress? I did. I may look ugly, but I got good taste. <laughs> now, buddy, when they put that little dress on Jody, oh, I kept her and I dressed her. I'm still keeping her and dressing her, I think, sometimes. <laughs> Kathy, we can't go to a mall without Kathy buying something for Jody. Hey, I'm going to buy that for Jody. I said, let Ed buy that for Jody. Ed can buy that for Jody. And they don't mind. She never asks us for anything. You know, Jody and I very independent. They, they never, I said, but, you know, Kathy just wants to do it. I mean, now nah, it's rubbed off on me. The other day I was at a place, I said, I think Ed would like that. You know, he's a surfer. You know, he's into that surfing stuff. And I said, I think he'd like that piece of artwork. I'm going to buy that for Ed. Kathy says, you're learning. <laughs> Turn it loose, Jesse. The Lord gave it to you. Turn it loose. So I'm doing the best I can. Lucifer, Jesse, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. But what you lose here, turn it loose. <laughs> okay, I will. Now, you see, a lot of people working hard for God. Some people hardly working. It doesn't make no difference about that. I leave that between you and God. But you must have thrown time for the will of God to operate in your life. Do you know before I ask, he answers? See, now when I get in church sometimes, they say, let us pray. I say, hey, Lord, you know, what do you think about it? He said, I already did that. You did? I didn't even have a chance to see that. He said, well, you'll see it when you get out of here. I have to watch what I say because I get it. God is my witness. I get it. I'm not bragging. I'm just the truth. I have to watch what I say because I will get it. The Lord will bless me. And you know why? Not because he loves me more by no means than you, but I may spend more time with him. I do spend my time. I was up this morning. I said, boy, Lord, you know that pizza ate last night? Yeah, I could hear it. <laughs> I said, oh, man. I said, well, that devil tried to put a little hard burn on me. I'm just going to spend a little throne time. So I just got up and sat down. I said, whoa, <laughs> Lord. I didn't ask him no healing. Didn't need to. Foop, it went away just like that. I said, I was about ready to, to talk with you about that piece of pizza. He said, I took care of it. Thank you. He said, you're welcome. I said, you know, Lord, when I was real young, I could eat anything. He said, that's right. I said, but you know, now sometimes I get little burps that come up and gives me little messages. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Don't do that. 
I'm a chili person. I love chili. I can eat chili at 2 o'clock in the morning. Pots of it. Not no more. Ooh, Lord Jesus. I just sit there and all the... Ooh. Ooh. So I said, oh, devil, you want to mess with me on this chili? I'm getting up and I'm going to talk to God about it. I have never, ever, God did not instantly, miraculously touch me. Before I asked. Before I asked. I said, why you do that, Lord? He said, because I love you. And you ought not be eating all that kind of grease. I said, Lord, don't touch my grease. Don't touch my grease, Lord. I'm a grease man. You can have all the broccoli you want. I'll give you gas. Go on, eat, eat your broccoli. I, I, I like grease. I know it ain't no good, but I like it. I like fried chicken, Lord Jesus. The other day I was with somebody. I don't know who it was. Uh, one of the staff. No, Ricky, that's who it was. He said, you want to go to Popeye? I said, no, just drive by and let me spell it. <laughs> Lord, begin to deal with me about it, you know. He said, you want me to drive? I said, just drive by slow. He said, are you serious? Yeah, Rick. We're going to go to a restaurant and have a salad. But we're going to drive by Popeye's and take a nose hit. <laughs> now, for you people in the 70s, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Look at some of the people. Nose hit, you don't want to know about that. How'd you know about nose hit? I spent time with people who showed me how to do that. <laughs> so he, he stops and I went, ah, oh, Lord. And the Lord said, memory. I said, like, yeah, I mean, I can't eat it no more, Lord. He said, you eat it once in a while, but I don't want you eating it every day. He said, that's not good for your body. Not that it's bad, but anything I guess you eat every day, something, you know. So I took two nose hits and ate a salad. I thought about that chicken for six hours after I smelled that thing. I did. I had a He said, you just tempted yourself. Which brings me to this point. There's nothing wishy, washy, or uncertain at the throne of God. Write this down. There's nothing wishy-washy or uncertain at the throne God, uh, at the throne of God. God is the same on the earth as he is in heaven. The Lord told me something about promises. He said, to you, my word is promises. To me, my promises are prophecies. Write that down, that'll help you. See, when God promises something to you, it's a promise to him, it's a prophetic utterance. He's actually saying this, thus saith the Lord, by my stripes you are healed. Now we take it as a promise. God speaks it as a prophecy, a prophetic utterance coming forth. And I realize that he's very serious about his word. In one of my throne time sessions, I said, why do you give yourself so many names? He said, I'm very big. I said, could you explain that further? He said, I have many facets that the human brain cannot understand. And the way I get to them is through words. So they can understand definitions of words so they can get a concept of me. He said, because most of my children never visit me. They just visit my house. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good here. How many of y'all want the will of God on the earth? On the earth. Now. The reason why I believe in prosperity, because, see, I need it here so I don't act like an idiot when I get to heaven. Because, see, if you live in a trailer all your life and all of a sudden you're brought to a mansion, you ain't going to know what to do with it. You're going to try to park your car in the front yard and change the oil, put it on blocks. You can't do that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they're driving up the front yard. No, you can't do that. You go to a trailer park, man, they're driving the front yard, put it on blocks, change it all, drive away. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Kathy, we were so poor, we didn't know nothing about China. Uh, you know, I, I asked a person, said, if you want to bless your wife, I don't want to be married, Kathy, just a little while. She said, they said, give her some China. China what? 
All I ever eat on my life was plastic plates. I usually like them Corel plates because you could drive your car over me. It wouldn't hurt. Us. I said, this will last forever. What's the name of the plastic plate? Merrimack? Something? I don't can't remember. Mail, yeah, Mailmack. You got some of that stuff? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. So I'm going to show you how stupid we were. I decided that I'm going to buy this beautiful woman, my wife, some china. So I went to a place where they sold china. <laughs> Talk about the ignorance going to seed. True story. We go up there and they said, can we help you? Boy, and they all dressed up in there, you know. Real nice, you know. I said, I'm looking for some china for my wife. Have you picked a pattern? <laughs> pattern of what? <laughs> oh, you mean what kind of plate I want? She said, yes, sir, you have to pick a pattern. I said, okay. I said, but what's the good stuff? She said, well, all of it's good, but we have things that we got some, they're all different prices. We have fine English bone china. You like that? Fine English bone china. I said, made out of bone? No, no, it's not made out of bone. Why'd you name it bone? I don't know why they name it bone. It just, I'm start arguing with the crazy woman. I said, I'm thinking like a dog. I don't want to give my wife no dog bone, you know? And I said, you know, I know what a bone, fine English bone china. I'm telling you the truth here. She said, why don't you just come on over here? So she took me a real nice lady. And I would say the uh, display was about as big as this, you know. She said, there's all kind of patterns. Just pick what you want. So I'm looking around. I said, I kind of like blue. And she said, well, she said, we do have raw Dothan. You ever heard of them? No. The only thing I ever heard was raw crown. That's why I, I, I don't know raw Dothan. But I know raw crown pretty good. <laughs> or crown raw, whatever it was. See, I was drinking. Sometimes I mix up the names. And those things. Give me some of that raw crown. I mean crown raw, whatever it was. You know, stuff in that bag. Don't act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Look at all y'all. <laughs> Crown raw. So I saw this. It said, Raw Dothan Carlisle, right? Raw, raw Dothan Carlisle. Is that correct? Is that right? Help me out here, woman. I can't remember. You said you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> raw Dothan Carlisle. I said, I like that. She said, sir, that's our most expensive pattern. I said, well, how much is it? That's says years ago now. She said, no, nah, it's way higher than that. She said, it's $125 a place set. I said, well, all I need is six. <laughs> she said, I, I said, I, she said, for, it's $125 for a five place setting. I said, well, all I need is six. I said, just give me eight. She said, yes, sir. I said, put it on this card. Well, man, I call her, I said, I got a bill for almost $3,000. I call that woman and say, y'all done messed up. Y'all told me this was $125 for a five-place study. She said, that's correct. I said, well, why are you charging me $3,000? She said, sir, that's for one person to eat. You got to be kidding me. You mean one person's going to use $125? Dollars just to eat? I said, at that price, we can't put nothing on the plate. I couldn't believe. You mean to tell me that's 125 times eight? She said, yes, sir. She said, you also wanted some serving pieces. Well, how much is that vegetable bowl? That's $385. I hate vegetables. Send it back. I could not get over that. By the time I got hit with China, I had about eight, nine thousand dollars in that thing. I needed to spend more time over there. So that's a true story. I'll tell you a little secret. This is years ago, brother and sister Coke came to my house. <laughs> brother said, so this is I'm probably what, man, man, seven, eight years ago or something like that. So Brother Coke come in and glory and they said, um, that's a nice house, Jess. I said, thank you. So Brother Colton walked me in the dining room. He said, that's some fine-looking china. I said, thank you. We're just looking at it. He said, y'all eat on it? I said, they ain't for eating. That's for looking. <laughs> he just looked at me. He said, I said, y'all got some china? He said, yeah, it's for looking. They ain't for eating either. Yeah. 
You gotta kind of look at that stuff. <laughs> but you know, as I spent more time in the finer things of life, I began to know some things. So I would learn how to operate and function because God's not one dimensional. He's spiritual, he's physical, and he's financial. You see what I'm saying? So I realized that living out the will of God includes throne time. So that's not a prayer meeting. So I could learn multifacets of God other than just his word. Just some things he wants to do, some things he likes doing. I began to ask him about the universe. How'd you do some of these things? Because, you know, that interests me. Just in our solar system, it would take 25,000 years to get out of it. Traveling at the speed of light, just our solar system. Our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy. There's another galaxy coming at us. They're going to hit in 4 billion years. And that's the Andromeda galaxy coming straight at us. And in 4 billion years, it'll hit us because it's traveling 300,000 miles an hour. The whole galaxy. And it's crossed. It will come. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy will come and hit. And the Lord gave us some hints about some of these things. They said that the sun would turn red. That when the sun began to uh, go out or burn out, that it begins to enlarge. You know, if we would live that long in terms of in the physical, the sun would literally cover the whole sky. It would totally, it would totally swallow Venus and Mars as it burns out. You see what I'm saying? Turning red. And it's amazing how he gave us hints and things. And I said, man, there ain't going to be much left. He said, that's right. I told you, he said, this earth will be destroyed by fire. He said, that's why I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. I said, well, you know, I can understand you giving us a new earth because we sure have polluted this one. Well, why would you want a new heaven? Because what you got is pretty nice. He said, this one's used. I said, what? This is just enthroned. This is used. He said, you know how long we've been living here? I said, I have no idea. He said, your mind couldn't contain it if I told you. He said, Jesse, when I come to get you and my family, I'm going to get something new and you're going to get something new. I said, thank you, man. It's, I said, it's good to be saved. He said, oh, it don't get no better. Now you think about that. Now you learn those things. You begin to learn. Actually, it's the same with making friendships. You first meet somebody, become friends. But as you begin to know them, the finer things of their lives begin to come out. And other things. But as you get closer to God, you get to a point where adoration, fascination, visitation cannot encompass who he is. So when I go to church, I learn about him in terms of school time. Oh, when I go to throne time, my mind gets clear so that when I read scripture, revelation begins to flow. Now write this down. Living out the will of God includes refusing to be confused. So many people become confused when God has given you light and understanding. Never forget that spiritual truths must be spiritually discerned. Write that down. Spiritual truths must be spiritually discerned. The problem with theologians, because if anybody loves education, I do. But the problem, they try to intellectualize a spiritual truth. And it comes out called heresy. It comes out thinking in the mind when it wasn't developed for the soul or the mind. It was developed for the spirit. So spiritual truths must be spiritually discerned. You have to use that fact of faith to incorporate, to understand the full length, breadth, depth, and height of that spiritual truth. And your mind may not be conformed or transformed enough to receive it in the soulless realm. That's why so many people are against prosperity. They have spirit prosperity, but they have soul poverty. So they fight it, which is the life of Christian confusion. Well, I know God said that, but. Now, you see, that's a, a, that's a confused individual. Well, if you know God said it, you said something called, you know, God said, no, you don't know God said it. You don't even believe God said it because you're fighting against it. Now, your spirit can grasp it because it spiritually discerns it. 
But when he tries to give that answer to the soul that has not been transformed, it can't handle it. And all of a sudden, soul poverty kicks in. You know what I had a man tell us one time? Oh, all oh, you and that Copeland and that dollar guy and that Savelle guy, y'all just give to each other. What's wrong with that? We're good soil. Well, what's wrong with that? That's good soil. We all believe in God. But we also, you, you don't know those men and you don't know me. You don't realize what we give. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I can't hardly go anywhere in the world. I'll run into a Kenneth Copeland partner. And then, you know, they say this. A tell brother and sister Copeland, I said hi. Now you think, why would they say that? Because see, in their spirit, they know that couple. So spiritual truths must be spiritually discerned. That's why you get some of these guys on CNN and Fox and MSNBC trying to explain a spiritual concept and they just blow it to pieces. And anybody with any brain can figure that out because, see, you're spiritually right. You go, what are you saying that for? You know, I got on something last night that was kind of touchy. I understand that. But see, I've learned something that the Jesus told us to do away with sin, to eradicate it and also to eradicate poverty. He said, the spirit of Lord God's upon me for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. But you will never get rid of poverty financing it. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. The Lord spoke that to me in throne time. He said, you can't get rid of poverty financing it. When will we get past the piece of bread that we're sending? When will the child go further than a piece of bread? Nothing wrong with giving them bread. Maybe that's maybe the only meal they got. I'm not being critical of that. What I'm saying is, when can we tell them that you will no longer have to have worry about somebody, some truck coming down some dusty road in Africa to take care of you? How do we give that child or that person a future? You'll never do it financing poverty. And the church world is real good at financing poverty. Jesus never told us to finance it. He told us to eradicate it. You see what I'm saying? Now, oh, I, I, I don't, I'll don't. probably get some ugly. Oh, you don't like missions? Yeah, yeah, I support missions, yes. I'm a heavily supportive of missions, not the issue. But you see, I want more for that child than a cup of soup. Now, not me and Brew. Why don't you just give more? Well, why don't you faith more? I told a bunch of people one time, why, why don't we just get a bunch of McDonald's Happy Meals and send them out there? Can you imagine a kid in Africa getting a McDonald's Happy Meal? You think he worried about if it's healthy or not? <laughs> oh, you know how much money that would cost? That's your problem. See, you worried about paying that. Well, it took the same amount of faith to put that bowl of soup in that kid's hand. It take the same amount of faith to just believe God, McDonald's might want to get involved in that. That'd be a good ploy for marketing. Can you imagine that many kids getting towards the McDonald meals? Ronald McDonald in and in Darfur? That's unheard of. Well, before you ever went there, you had to believe it by faith to start with. And if faith is being an operation, then let's, God, let's believe for the best. Why not? Oh, that's silly. Ah, oh, because you're intellectualizing that. you saying that can't be done. So let's finance it every year. There ain't nothing wrong with blessing it. Don't misunderstand. But see, they got to get to a point where that trouble quits. See, when you got saved, you became authority, Lord over sin, sickness and disease. And it's up to you to acknowledge that and walk in that. Can I say something going to shock you? I do not sin every day. I heard it all my life. You got to sin every day. That's a lie. That's a religious churchy lie. I go long extended periods of time without sinning. The only time I sin is when I make myself. When I get in the flesh and do something. But if I crucify my flesh daily instead of Sunday, I don't fulfill that. Tell me I sin every day. I don't. But I heard that all my life. Well, you know, you just got to sin every day. No, I don't. I'm not a sinner. I once was a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Do you see that? Do you understand that? Don't try to intellectualize that. Just accept it. I'm the righteousness of God. Oh, that make people hot. hot. Who do you think you are? The righteousness of God. What makes you think you're righteous? The Lord said I was righteous. Well, you sure don't look righteous. Well, I'm glad he ain't looking through your eyeballs.
Sometimes I don't feel righteous. Let me help you with this. Sometimes I don't feel saved, but I am. And I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I don't want to be saved. Sometimes I just want to get in the flesh. Don't look at me with your pious looks. Sometimes you want to cuss. Come on, tell the truth. Because you cannot exp- That's the only way you can express what you feel it. You got agitated there, Vicky. That's what happened. Because nice words just don't cover it. You know why you're laughing? Because you did it. Because you just could you. But that's still wrong. You can shut that down. Why? Because now you're moving in an electro, the solar realm, which is soul poverty. I told Kathy one time, not too long ago, I said, you make me so mad, you make me sin. You are making me sin. <laughs> she said, you devil from hell. I said, once, woman, I'm going to tell you something. Call me devil from hell. <laughs> and then one time right in my face, she said, get out of here, devil. Jesse, stay where you are. Shut me down, I'm going. <laughs> Devil left me by myself <laughs> to face that woman. You piece of trash, you left me. I about ready to give her a piece of my mind and you took off. He said, hey, I know strength when I see it. <laughs> she said, now what do you want, honey? <laughs> do you need prayer? Oh. Oh, prayer. I want no prayer. You know why you're laughing? Because it happened to you. <laughs> Probably this morning. <laughs> Bible said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I've had Kathy mad at me, boy, and I've used that scripture to the fullest extent. <laughs> she mad all day. Can women get mad? They think about <laughs> <laughs> most men just blow up. <laughs> They're like a dog. <laughs> and that's it. Women like cats. <laughs> <laughs> dog give up real quick. <laughs> Cat. Oh, I'll never forget, boy. I hollered at Kathy. Kathy, come here! Oh, she don't like me to holler, raise my voice. Kathy, come here! She said, what are you? I said, sun going down. Come on, mama. Come on. Come on. Sun going down, mama. Come on. Repent. Come on. <laughs> sun going down. Do it. Do it. It's almost down. You're about ready to go to hell. Come on. Sun going down. Repent. She goes, Aah! I'm sorry, I pardon you. You can tell women, huh? Look at them. I was wrong. But it felt so good. It's just... Let me hurry here. I'm going to take you over in tomorrow's session. Let me say this, living out the will of God includes refusing to be confused. Doug, lift your hand up, Doug. Doug buys all my television time. I never forget Doug when he came to our office. And we like Doug. Doug's such a blessing to us. The way Doug just laughs. He's he happy, you know. I said, Doug, we won't go on television. I don't know if Doug remembers that. He said, okay. He said, well, you know, you have to establish how many stations you want to go on. With. We was going on secular. I never forget we down there. That's when we was in number 12, Stowhouse Lane. He said, now, and he gave me all the particulars and all the different things of what we're going to do and how normally what it takes to pay for something, this and that. And he asked this, he says, uh, well, he said, normally it takes, well, I think it was like, a, I don't know, 10 months, say 18 months, you know, establish yourself out there so people know who you are so you can get this all paid. He said, how long y'all want to, have, how long y'all want to, believe, I know y'all going to believe God. How long you, <laughs> do y'all want to believe God so we get this thing paid? Me and Ken said, two weeks. I don't know if Doug remember. He went, oh, they've been listening to them Copeland tapes. <laughs> <laughs> why not why not why not and you know it worked 
my first two weeks of ministry on television paid for everything. I've never struggled ever on television ever in my life. Give the Lord a hand clap. Oh, and I'm building a war chest. Ooh, Jesus, I mean that war chest. Because we're going to launch out into the deep. Look out, look out, devil. And sometimes Kathy says it's time, because sometimes I go, maybe we shouldn't do that. You need to do that now. I said, is the Lord speaking that to you? Why do you always say that? I said, what did God say? I said, you ain't talked to God today? Bow your head. Talk to him. Let me know. <laughs> Don't I do that? I said, all right, what did he say? She said, you know, Jesse, I think we all do. I said, did the Lord say that? Well, I don't know if the Lord. I said, bow your head. Fine, now let me know. I said, what did he say? Well, he didn't say nothing just that quick. Bow your head. Say it again. <laughs> That's how I do business. God, he, he, he ain't wait. He ain't going. Uh, 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 uh. You know what he said? <laughs> I said, did God say that? Come it. Now, don't you make me mad. I ain't making you mad. Did God say that? Yes, I said, then what are you talking to me for? Move on it. You're burning daylight, woman. Let's go. <laughs> I'm like that. I'm blunt. And then sometimes she said, why are you doing that? I said, because the Lord told me to do it. Follow me. Yes, sir. I said, but we ask each other about that. Did the Lord say that? Yeah. What did the Lord say? And, and, and be very honest. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, Kathy, we, I ain't really prayed about it. Well, why don't you just go in there and pray? Prime example, when I bought Storehouse Lane, it was a piece of property I still own. Kathy wanted me to buy this property. I sent her out. I said, go out and spy out the land. <laughs> I sent her out. I said, go out and spy out the land, find me a building. She said, okay. Now, this is when, man, I'm telling you, we had, what, seven people working for us then? This was years ago. Watch this. I know the voice of God. How do you know? That's not arrogance. It's called throne time. Happy, it's just throne time. I know, the, I know your voice. If you say, I, that's happy call. Why? Well, I've heard it many times. I know Jeannie's voice when she speaks to happy. Call well. That's all I'm going to say. But I tell you what, I know Jeannie's voice. <laughs> so I said, I said, Kathy, spy out the land. Okay. I said, I'm going on the meet. When I come back, maybe you can give me some prospects. Oh, well, sure enough, I got back. She's all excited. Kathy loved the shop. Whether it's clothes, building, money, she said, yeah, man. glory to God. When we were decorating, and the whole life story, I tell you, when we were decorating our buildings, she would leave with a van. She said, Jesse, turn me loose. Just turn me loose, Jesse. I said, what? She said, turn me loose, Jesse. Turn me loose. Let me just go get what I need to decorate this whole, I got 122,000 square foot here. You're talking a lot of pictures here. You're talking a lot of stuff. Just turn me loose. I said, okay, go ahead. I thought she would take the van. I got Kathy in this big truck of mine. <laughs> Where's she going? She said, I'm decorating. <laughs> I don't get to keep driving like an 18, not what an 18 wheeler, but big truck. She gonna fill it up. And she decorated the place, and the place looks wonderful. Now, let me get back to the other story. Where was I? Was you listening? You don't know what I'm talking about. Where was I, Butch? Piece of property. Piece of property. property. See, Butch knows. I'm just joking with you, my man. <laughs> So I come back, she says, I got the property, I got the property. Now, we, ain't ha we didn't have much money, Bill, like, to, to get out of town. We didn't have much, you know. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, she says, this is this building. I said, Kathy, that's a million dollar building. She said, yeah. She said, maybe we can get it for $250,000. I said, woman, <laughs> you can't buy the bottom floor. For two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, maybe if you prayed about it, big faith man. <laughs> Going by what I see, I know what something costs. I look at it. She said, "Well, I'm going to ask them." They had nine doctors in there. So it's a medical. Med was a medical facility. So. I said to myself, you got to be kidding. Shut up, Kitty. You're going to kill everything but your mouth. Shut up. And I could hear the Lord say, let me put my hand on your mouth. Shut up. Kathy's on a mission. Well, come to find out, they want to sell this building, sell it fast. Oh, okay. So, man, Kathy cuts the deal. I can't. She gets it. Watch this. I can't believe because she was. I wasn't believing. I'm looking. 
ain't no way you're going to buy that building for $250,000. It can't be. I mean, this, that building then was, was an 11,000 square foot building. I mean, it's nice. She comes, she goes, well, Reverend Whitehead, <laughs> calls me names, you know. <laughs> Reverend Whitehead, guess what? Done. They will give us that building for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I said, "You lying?" <laughs> she said, "I ain't lying." She said, "Now you go in your study and you pray about that because you don't want to got to release that money." So I walk in that study. I said, "God," and God just throw the wrench in the fire. He said, "Jesse, you can pay two fifty, but I'm gonna pay two forty." I said, would you say that again one more time? What did you say? He said, uh, you can pay 250 but I'm going to pay 240 I said, Kathy, I just spoke to the Lord. What did he say, Jesse? What did he say? I said, he said, we could pay 250 but he's going to pay 240 Get your ugly self back in there. He, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Go back in there and pray. I said, what? That's what the Lord said. Well, what did that mean? I don't know what it means. Don't you understand English? Don't you holler at me. I ain't hollering at you. I'm just trying to hear myself talk up over you. You lying. Well, that was a lie right there, but I'm just saying. <laughs> now we arguing here. I said, I'm telling you, woman. God said we could pay 250, but he gonna pay 240. Cut the deal. She said, I ain't gonna ain't say that. I said, just do it. So we go to the, and we had to close it like this. <laughs> you know, I'm the dog, she's the cat. <laughs> I was waiting for that lawyer said, have y'all had a bad day? <laughs> we buy the thing. We buy the building. Kathy says, I'm going to the doctors and tell them that their leases are running out. I mean, we're not going to you know, renew their leases. I said, that'll be fine. She goes in there. Come to find out, I paid two fifty, but the doctors owed us ten thousand dollars on the lease and paid us. So God paid two forty. True story. So I said, Kathy, come here, little Miss Prissy. What you want, whitehead? How much did the Lord pay? Say it, Kathy. Come on, say it. You didn't think I heard the voice of God? Say it. Say it one time for me. It will bless me. How much did the Lord say he would pay? She said, you might keep talking. You're going to have to ask him for a healing in a minute. You know what I'm saying? I said, well, I just thought I wanted you to kind of say that, you know, because, you know, I heard the voice. Of, she said, Jesse, I don't. I know you heard the voice of God, but it just didn't make any sense. Why? Because you try to intellectualize the spiritual truth. And we've all done that. But as you spend more time at the throne and you refuse to be confused, and I'm going to pick up on that tomorrow and close out with it. You get to a point, man, I'm telling you what, man. Decisions are made before you have a chance to, to debate them. God's already done something, moving something so quick, you just flow in in that anointing, and God's honoring it and blessing it. You see, so if you want to live out the will of God on the earth, you got to include throne time. You see, because it's vitally important. Because remember again, throne time is not church time. Church time is school time. And if you miss either one, you're in trouble. You have to go to church. Let me tell all you people watching by the internet, don't let that thing become a tool to deceive you. Well, I ain't gonna turn to church no more. I'm gonna just stay here and watch Bud Jesse on his website. Also, excuse me. The Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. You need corporate faith around you. That's why you need to be a part of a church and under the direction of a pastor. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a preacher. Because anybody can lay in bed and watch church. See what I'm saying? But just like you make your kids get up and go to school, 
you're going to have to get up and go to school. That's called church time. And learn the oracle of God. Did you enjoy it this morning? You got your Bible once again. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Hallelujah. I want to start reading with verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6. And in my day sessions, I have been ministering on living out the will of God on the earth. I don't need no money in heaven. I don't need no healing in heaven. I don't need anything of that nature in heaven. I need it on the earth. And I've heard all my life, well, when you get to heaven is when you can have it. And I've told the people in our first session on Monday, either you lying or God's lying and I pick you. Because God's not man that he can lie. And we go to the most famous prayer ever prayed. It fell from the lips of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, verse 9. Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father, not a Father, not some Father, but our Father. Who art in heaven, you got to know where your Father is at all times. Where he is and where he is on the earth. He's at the throne in heaven and he's inside you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I told you that his name is equal to himself. Some of you are going over your notes. Thy kingdom come. That's God's mission on the earth. Same mission that was in heaven and that is in heaven is on the earth. Thy will be done. That is his desire or the blessing. Because the first thing he did to mankind was he blessed them. Or he gave them the ability to prosper. As it is in heaven, God is no respecter person. I told the people, you will determine today or infect today what some things will happen in heaven. And you will also affect what happens on the earth. Because God said what you bind on the earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. So you will affect heaven's economy today by what you do upon the earth. Isn't that good? And then you will be affected by what they do in heaven. Here on the earth, both ways, because we're not servants of God. We're sons of God, daughters of God who serve. So we're family. I told them that we are the only species ever created by God that can sit down in his presence. Angels got to stand at attention. Every angel, archangel, the wheel within the wheel, the full cre the creatures at the, at the very throne of the most high have to stand. But he made you sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Think about that. That's why Satan hates you. Because you were created in a higher and a higher order and class than he was. I'm preaching better than y'all shouting. That is some powerful stuff. So you will determine today what happens in heaven by what you do on earth. The power of who you are. So we dealt with that in part one. We dealt, now I'll go over this then and we'll get into the last part. We dealt with living out the will of God includes confession. But the church world for 2,000 years don't like to confess and possess. They prefer to possess than confess. See, they say, I'm not saying I'm healed when I am sick. We're not dealing with your am sick. We're dealing with your word healed. If you'll focus on your word healed, you'll change your am sick. And if you want to know that God did it, he called it those things that be not as though they were. And in Genesis 1, it shows how God confessed and he possessed. He said, light be. He confessed it and light was. But see, the church will and the Christian said, well, I ain't saying it till I get it. But well, then do you want to talk you want to be an imitator of God as dear child or do you want to go your old rebellious way? You see what I'm saying? You must confess and possess. So living out the will of God includes confession, which is the confession engine of the word is where the power lies. We dealt with that. Then we dealt with living out the will of God includes childlike faith, which means simply trusting God. In other words, God says something, you go, OK. And you go forth just like your children do. And we did that in part one. Then in part two, we, we dealt with living out the will of God includes using the power within you. There's a bad, very bad habit that people say when the Lord get ready, it's going to get done. No, he, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. And if you don't learn to develop the power that was in you, you can live saved, full of the Holy Ghost and beat slap the pieces all the days of your life. And when you get to heaven, you're going to look like an idiot. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Is there any debt in heaven? No. Let me ask you this. Is there any gravel in heaven or asphalt? Walking on some pretty nice stuff. Are there any trailers in heaven? Did you ever see? Where they, how about some FEMA trailers? You see they got any FEMA trailers in heaven or something like that? <laughs> Mobile homes. What, what, what kind of houses are in heaven? Yeah. What? Yeah. 
Why aren't you living in a mansion on the earth? Well, you can tell when it hits. People go, ha ha. His will be done. Enter. Why would God be mad at you if you had a mansion on the earth? When he said he'll give you a mansion in heaven. And you know, if you have never lived in a mansion, you don't know how to act. There are going to be some people trying to drive up that car in the front yard and change the oil, put it on the blocks. They ain't going to work. So you got to have a different way of thinking. His will be done in earth. So if he don't mind you having a mansion in heaven, why would he mind that you have a mansion on the earth? Don't shout me down. This is living out the will of God. See? Then yesterday I dealt with, I think, a very powerful part of this. And you need to get it because it's a serious. Living out the will of God includes throne time. And I told you that throne time is not church time. Church time is school time. Church is where you learn how to operate and function. Throne time develops from relationship to fellowship. And throne time does not mean you having a prayer meeting with God. You're not even dealing with prayer. Because most of the time prayer is asking God to do something. This throne time is fellowship time. Church time is school time. And I dealt with that, that when you visit the throne, you won't come back with conflicting ways to deal with life. So I find a lot of ministers, boy, they always have conflicting ways. And I said, why? You don't have much throne time. You only have church time. I'm talking about just say, what's up? What's up, Jesus? Throne time example. God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Wasn't giving him any instruction. Just hanging out with his creation. Knowing each other. See, that's throne time. See what I'm saying? He didn't say, now, all right, this is how I want you to operate this. No, he already said at the very beginning. He says, he blessed them. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. That was church time. Now, go do that, and I'll see you tomorrow, and we'll just talk and have some fun. Say, throne time. That's how people say, see, my brother Jesse don't have a lot of problems. Like, oh, I have a lot of problems, but when I got throne time, I have answers. I don't even, before I ask, he answer. He said, the Lord loved Jesse. Just love me. He can't help himself. He loves me. That's not arrogance or cockiness. That's assurance and confidence. See, now how do you know that? Throne time. And then the other night, uh, Pastor Happick always said, boy, you got pretty deep there for a while when you start dealing with theoretical physics and quantum physics and quantum mechanics and E equals MC square. I mean, I, I was born at night, but not last night. Cages, there are some Cajuns with brains in their heads. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I, I, I just laugh at the scientists. We have theoretical professors. We have professors of theoretical physics, which means it's a theory. We're going to give it the best shot. <laughs> and they say that if you don't understand that, then you're not academic and that you're foolish. Yet we have something. We have something even greater than theory. We have faith that actually operates and we have creative miracles that we have physical evidence. that They can say God that isn't real. Neither is gravity till you jump off the roof. <laughs> you don't feel gravity right now, do you? No. But you actually do. You just don't realize it. You got used to it. That's what's keeping you on the floor. Now you don't float to the top of this thing. You say, do you see my point? You understand what I'm saying? So, we, so when you, sort of, you show scientists evidence of our way of believing, which is faith, Oh, I don't believe that. Yeah, but you want me to get out there and believe with you on a theoretical physics. I have actually more evidence than you do. See what I'm saying? But see, so you, you need to get that. Now I want to finish this. This is part four. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James chapter one. I want to read some scripture that Brother Jerry read the other day and ministered a little bit on. And I'll use that as part of this uh, closing out this um, my session here on living out the will of God on the earth. James chapter one, verse one. It says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greedy. Now, I had a preacher who was homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical, theological. He said, this really doesn't apply to us because this is being wrote to the Jews. I said, but I'm Jewish. He said, you're not Jewish, you're a Cajun. I said, I'm adopted. And an adopted child has the same legal rights as a blood child. Especially in the United States of America. 
Now it says this, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. See, and automatically, because of punctuation, people say, let's just shout when the devil beats us. It's not saying that. You can't count all joy till you know something. See, so if you take away that little colon or semicolon, you would do this. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this. You got to know this before you can ever count it all joy on anything, knowing this, that your fa- that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect or matured work. Now watch this, that you may be perfect or matured and entire wanting nothing. Underline wanting nothing. How many of you would love to get up tomorrow and not want for nothing? That's what that's saying. Actually, if the devil messes with you, he's increasing your wealth. He's so stupid. He's called the author of confusion. The boy is confused. If he would, I, I, I tell people all the time, if the devil would leave people alone, most people go to hell by themselves. They just get stagnant. Don't want to do nothing lazy. But he pushes people to God. If he just leave people alone. But you know, he's not a faith devil, but a flesh devil. So he only thinks in the natural. And as I said earlier in one of the sessions, he can't tempt you what's not common to you. There's a scripture there. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Where is it? Go find it. I'm not going to tell you every scripture, but go find it. In other words, if the temptation is not common to you, you can't use it. So why would you fall for something you already know about? Does that make any sense to anybody? He cannot use any knowledge of what he knew before he knew you to tempt you. And you going to fall for that? So when the devil gives me some trouble, I say, oh, the idiot. He just made me wealthier today. <laughs> then I've heard the devil say, stop. Don't mess with him no more. <laughs> Watch this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him read a book. <laughs> I don't think so. If any of you lack wisdom, uh, this is throne time. Let him ask of God. Then ask something from God. Just let him ask God. That's throne time. Not from God. Hey God, uh, could you help me on that? Let him ask of God. Or that giveth to all men, that means women, or people, liberally. So he's not just trying to get you by. That's called survival. He's empowered you to prosper. Not survive, but prosper. Notice this. And uh, an unbraided knot, and it shall be given. It, not, not that it might be, it shall be. See, that's how you get stuff. If you want stuff, it's done through throne time. Notice when grandchildren hang around with grandparents, they go away with something. You ever notice that? They just hang around after a while, man, grandparents looking for something to buy them kids. Why you call them grandchildren? You got to spend at least a grand on them. You know it. That costs more than kids. You know how that is. There's something you just want to do. That's actually fellowship time. You begin to know your grandson or your grandbaby or whatever, your granddaughter, whatever. You begin to know. Even though they may be of your blood, you got to get to know them. And all of a sudden they start doing things that everybody sees. Act just like a daddy. Does things just like a grandma. He has the same genes in it or her. Now, what here we want to do is get to this verse here. Verse, um, well, let's, let's keep reading. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Now, that's a big statement. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that is wavering is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Watch this. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The reason why a double-minded man is unstable, he's a two-souled man. He lives only in the soulless realm of who he is. He has become what I call two-dimensional. He's moved by his flesh and he's moved by a, a conform, not, a, not a, con, a conformed mind to the world instead of a transformed mind or soul to the spirit of God. Doesn't live out of his spirit, lives out of his soul, his mind, his will and his emotion. And then his body reacts to what that unstableness does. But if he live out of his spirit, transformed soul, crucified body, then he's walking the will of God in the earth, 
And he won't, have to, he won't be that surprised when he gets to heaven. Now write this down here. We're going to deal with this. Living out the will of God includes refusing to be confused. I refuse to be a fool living for Jesus. I refuse to be tempted to the point of falling when I already know what will happen if I did fall. I've had many opportunities to fail. I just don't take any. Why? Because I'm living out the will of God in the earth. I refuse to be a fool when it comes to the things of God and my way of life. And yet people say, are you ever tempted? Yeah, but tempting is not a sin. And the only time I'm tempted is in my flesh. But if I crucify that flesh daily instead of Sunday, I don't fulfill. After a while, you can't tempt a spirit, man. You can only tempt a flesh man or a flesh woman. Notice temptation only works in the realm of the flesh. Satan has now become totally one dimensional. You are a triune being. And God is three dimensional. He says it's spiritually, physically, financially. The church world says it's all spiritual. Well, that makes God one dimensional. The devil is one dimensional on, on the flesh side. God is one dimensional on the spirit side. But God is not one dimensional. He's spirit. He spiritually, physically, financially in every area of your life. That's why he lets you know how nice heaven is. Go read Revelation. He talks about all that stuff. Boy, that shocks some people. Oh, Lord. And what is Revelation? It's called a revelation of Jesus Christ. You want to understand? Can you never understand Revelation in the book of Daniel? Oh, yeah, you can. Just know more about Jesus. It's a revelation. Go read it. It's at the top of the page of your Bible in the book of Revelation. A revelation of Jesus Christ. What part of that you don't understand? You see my point? I'm not trying to make you sound foolish. It's so simple. You need a good theologian to help you misunderstand this. Did he really mean what he said? Yeah, he wrote it in red. Yeah. So living out the will of God includes refusing to be confused. So when I sow my seed, whether I see anything, if I start thinking, well, when is it coming back? Then I start taking on the care of that seed. And before you know it, I'm carrying it with weak hands. I'm heading for sure failure. So I refuse to be confused about my giving. Me and Kathy have never said, well, bless God, we gave all that money. We ain't never received nothing. No, we sow it and walk away. We shift into what I call harvest time. You know, a car has a first gear, but you'll burn it up if you try to just get too hard on it. But, you know, you put it in the right gear and go down the road, you'll get where you're going. So I refuse to be confused. Why? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I had a man tell me this the other day. It was a great compliment. I've been knowing you for 30 years. I said, well, thank you. You've never changed. I said, to what? <laughs> what would I change to? Do you think I'm going to change because the gospel or, quote, the church world has a wave coming? And all of a sudden, they make the wave the center of all the gospel. When it's not, it's a wave. And all of a sudden, the wave crashes on the beach. And you're sitting there in the foam. Just, and after a while, it gets stagnant. Get your surfboard and go back out and catch the next wave. One man said, I'm in the river. What about you? I said, well, I'm in the ocean. <laughs> he said, well, I said, river? The Lord, you can see both sides. I want to go where no man had gone before. Lord Jesus, I want the depthness of the ocean. The deep, call it the deep. Lord Jesus. I'm not against people that believe in river. Thank God. You see what I'm saying? But I say, I just, I'm not moved by what's happening last year. Oh, this is what's going on. Are you joining there? No, man. What I, listen, I got the best. Jesus is the center of both testaments. One leg in the old, one leg in the new. I got a Jewish friend of mine. He says, are you going to try to get me converted? No, no. Which I could, if I could, I would, but I can't. I said, man, God Almighty can't save you without your permission. Did you know that? He can't save a soul in here without their permission. You got to believe with your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible said you're saved. God Almighty can't save you. He said, well, why are you so much into Christianity? I said, man, let me help you. All I'm trying to do is to get you to believe in a Jew. <laughs> Aren't you Jewish? Yeah. You don't like your own people? Oh, well, yeah, that's all I'm trying to do. Just get you to believe in a Jew. I ain't trying to stop you from being Jewish. I just want you to believe in a Jew. Come on, you a Jew. Can't you believe in a Jew? Well, yeah, I can believe in a Jew. I said, well, come on. Accept the Jew. I ain't asking you to accept the Gentile. I'm asking you to accept someone of your bloodline. What's the matter with that? 
He says, you have a way of saying things. I said, well, I don't know about that. But all I'm telling you, I'm not trying to change you. I'm just trying to get, I accepted a Jew. Why can't you accept a Jew? He goes. I said, I understand. I understand. I said, you can find him all over the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It's, it's, he's just there. See, I refuse to be confused. Write this down. God's way of thinking is always pure, clear, right, and true. Now, when you understand that, there is no want of faith. You know, I never get up and say, I wonder if I can increase my faith. I never get up saying that. Can I increase my faith today? Because faith cometh. How do I make it come? By hearing, not by heard. Heard's a past tense thing. If you live in the past, you never see the future. But I never get up and say, how shall I increase my faith today? I said, I don't need to. It will come if I hear. And what was Jesus' most famous statement? He that hath an ear, let him hear what I'm saying. So God's way of thinking is always pure. It's always clear. It's always right. And it's always true. And when you understand those four things, there is no want of faith in your life. You see, I've realized something about the will of God. Most people, they're confused by it. I'm not. The will of God on the earth is not a confused place. Write that down. It's not a confused place. Tell your mind to get off the fence. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. It's a choice. I had a man tell me, well, I got a right. I said, you have no rights. You just have a choice. Well, Jesse, you, you, you always make decisions. I said, well, debates makes discussions. Decision makes choices. Debates, debates take time. That's democracy. Now, I like democracy. Don't misunderstand me. But I like somebody to make a decision. Like I said earlier, man, man, people ask me, say, what do you think about the presidential debates? What do you think about that? Well, it takes a lot of guts to run for president to start with. Well, number one thing, I, I, the debates are so amazing because it all winds up to see who's going to attack each other. Let's face it, everybody's nice till it starts getting close. Then you get nasty. You know, to try to win some election. And people say, Oh, I don't know. You know, let me let me just let the elevator go to the top. You don't spend two hundred million dollars to win a four hundred thousand dollar job. Because if you think you're only going to make four hundred thousand dollars, you are living in a dream world. You don't go to a state election and somebody spend twenty five million dollars or thirty five million dollars trying to win the governorship and the governorship pays a hundred thousand dollars. Come on. There's a reason for that. Why? Because they know where the next bridges are coming in. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. They know what's appropriate. They know what's coming down the pipe. Come on. That's why everybody wants to spend that kind of money. You don't spend that much. That's the worst investment in the world to spend that amount of money to get that kind of a job for that kind of pay. You know there's the benefits. The, the pay is nothing compared to the benefits. And the benefits is the knowledge of what's coming down the pike. I got a friend of mine told me, he said, man, I tell you, I want to be congressman. And, you know, <laughs> he's spending like $200,000 for a $35,000 a year job. <clears throat> he said, I'm going to represent the people. Yo, mama. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I said, you know when they're going to release that money. You know when them billions start kicking in Louisiana. That's why you want that possession I don't insult my intelligence I'm not saying you're a dishonorable man but don't insult my intelligence I said you're willing to go in debt to get a $35,000 a year job and the job you make around now pay $160,000 so you're going to drop that to make thirty five? dollars come on come on <laughs> but you know the American people go uh uh that's all he wants. <laughs> Most of them go and pull as a church rat and come out what? A king rat. <laughs> you know it and I know it. I refuse to be confused. Not only in the spiritual realm of knowing Christ, but also in the natural realm of what's going around me. So the will of God on the earth is not a confused place. Tell your mind to get off the fence. If you want to know the will of God, I mean, I want to know the will of God. All you got to do is read four chapters. It's the will of God for man. Four chapters. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Look at my fingers. 
the last two chapters in the book of Revelation. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Between them, two or four chapters, is 1186 chapters of killing, stealing, and destroying by an arch enemy called Satan. But Jesus is coming back. Come on. Wait, 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 wait. And we're going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and the last two chapters in the book of Revelation. And man's going to walk in the cool of the day. Amen. So, live long and prosper. <laughs> That's the will of God for you in Fort Worth, in Bangor, Maine, in Hong Kong, China, makes nowhere where you live. Everything else in between is a fight. That's God's will for you. You won't find debt. You won't find sickness. You won't find disease. You'll find peace, joy, throne time. A future that's literally out of sight. That's the will of God. Four chapters. Go read them. That's what God wants for you and never let nobody ever talk you out of it. Now, who's the author of the confusion? Satan, right? So if Satan is the author of confusion, which should give you a good tip, if you don't want to be confused, stay away from the author. <laughs> takes a while. It takes a while, but it hits. Just takes a while. Let me say it again. If Satan is the author of confusion, and we know he is, we should give you a tip. If you don't want to be confused, stay away from the author. I said this the other day, and I know I had some people blinking. I go long periods of time, one without sinning. I knew I, long periods. I'm serious. Let's go. You know, we went on a motorcycle trip with brother and sister Copeland and uh, brother and sister Burke and brother Happy and sister Jeannie. And, you know, we were together. What? Good Lord. We, we, me and brother and sister Copeland were together since the West Coast Believers Convention. So now you've got the West Coast Believers Convention, which was uh, where we went on Friday before to do TBN. Watch this. So that's Friday. And then Saturday, I think, went somewhere. And then Sunday, uh, Sunday, I preached at Art Aragon's church and everybody got ready and we did, we did our speaker meeting on live on television. And then we did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I helped in the healing school. And then Sunday, me and uh, Kathy and brother and sister Colson, we flew out so we could go ride our motorcycle. Now that's, that's, so that's 11 days. And then we were there. As I say, we got there and then we had to fly back to Washington, D.C. so we could do Christians United for Israel. So then now that was that's 11, t Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, finally Saturday, we flew back and we left. So that's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I went 17 days without sinning. <laughs> I didn't see Gloria sin. I was with her. I was with Brother Copeland. He didn't sin. We went 17 days without sinning. Can you believe it? But I've heard the religious world, you got to sin every day. We didn't. We enjoyed our fellowship. We talked about the things of God. We received refreshment. We received uh, uh, just rest that we needed. Now, we were working hard. I mean, I'm staying at it. I mean, as soon as we try to get rest, fly out to Washington, D.C., stand up, Christian United for Israel, stood for Israel, bless God, hallelujah, and then flew back. You know, and I... I flew back with them together. I didn't hear nobody saying. I didn't see nobody saying. Me and Kathy got on our plane at, 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 at the Copeland Field and we flew all the way home. We didn't sin. The next day we didn't sin. The next week we didn't sin. The only time if we ever sin is if we make ourselves. How can you go that long? We stay away from the author. Now, the author will try to make you sin. And then he realized he went a long time without sinning. Maybe if I can get them to fight. So we got up the next day and Kathy was. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a little. <laughs> You've heard me say it. Men are like dogs and women are like cats. Think about it. Men are like dogs. Women are like cats. Men are just like dogs. Barking on the dog. Hey, 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 hey. Women like cats. <laughs> you can't touch a cat till a cat's ready. <laughs> yes, Am I telling the truth? You ain't touching no cat. So. <laughs> whoa, whoa. But notice you can hug a dog anytime you want. <laughs> I'm telling you. Men are like dogs. Women are like cats. It's a fact. So I had gone all that time without sinning. 
I refused to be confused. And I realized the devil wanted me to get in an argument with Kathy. Why? Because he knows if he can get me heated up enough, I'm going to say something I don't mean. Then I'm going to have to say something I got to repent over. So I shut him down. Devil, get out of here. We've had a wonderful time. We will not allow you in this presence. You're not part of this conversation whatsoever at all. I said, Kathy, where are we going? Well, let's go over here. I said, let's go. Man, can I shock you? I can't remember the last time I did sin. Boy, I'm going to get some ugly letters. Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, you mad. Some of y'all right now go, you, <laughs> you Pharisees. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, I know it, I know it. But you ain't going to cut that television over because you're going to want to know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Why? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, is Christ in you? So if you decide to sin, does he say, listen, I'm going to go downtown so let you sin a while, then I'll come back after it's over with. No. If you don't want to be confused, and Satan's the author of confusion, stay away from the author. Oh, this is good stuff. How can he say that? I'm not a double-minded man. Oh, I'm making some people mad. I'm not a double-minded man. I'm not. My daughter's 35 years old. She said, if you ever get my dad to say something, he's going to do what he says. Now, you may have to push him to say it. And I've said things I shouldn't have said. But the Bible says you swear to your own hurt. So I said, because I said it, I'm going to do it. See what I'm saying? Because you, you live by scripture. You live by the word of God, not how you feel. Because sometimes I'm going to shock you. I get up in the morning sometimes I don't feel saved. Sometimes I don't want to be saved. And save sometimes give you limitations. Can't cuss. Can't hate. Gloria told me one time, she said, you know, when you're on television, you got to be nice all the time. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know it. And it's true. Because it's limitation. What it limits on, it, it shuts down all flesh. Especially through a transformed soul. And a living out of your spirit. And every time I've ever got rude to Kathy is when I went into my soulless realm and did something stupid. You know, I find as you get older, you talk to each other when you drive now. Do you know when I first married Kathy, she sat next to me? Sit on seatbelt buckles. You know that had to hurt. Huh? <laughs> sit right there. And I mean, I couldn't, I, I tried to turn the wheel. I did it. Not too long ago, she mad at me about something. She said, you don't love me like you used to. I said, hey, honey, I didn't move. <laughs> I'm in the same position as when I took you out at 17 years old. You the one moved on the other side. Shut up. Okay, I'll shut up. Just <laughs> watch it over there. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Watch it, watch it. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. Watch it, watch it. And then women, let me help y'all ladies all over the world. Don't ask you, don't ask questions that your husband got to lie. <laughs> Honey, does this make me look fat? <laughs> what do you think he's going to say? Because <laughs> if he tell the truth, it's a bad day. <laughs> you know it. Now, now, don't ask them kind of questions. I said, Kathy, if you like you, I like you. Answer the question. I had a woman that I didn't even know asked me that one time. In Hawaii at the Ala Moana Mall in the St. John Boutique. She put on this beautiful outfit and the color was perfect for her. It was beautiful. She's a beautiful lady. But she's a little chunky. Which is okay with me. Ain't none of my business. I'm a little chunky myself, so who cares? <laughs> I don't care. And her husband's sitting there. And in those fine restaurants, they always, have, not restaurant, fine dress boutique place, they offer you something to drink. You know, she never asked, get, nobody asked you at Walmart, would you care for a Coke? <laughs> go on to Walmart. <laughs> you should go in and get what you want, come out. But all those real fine boutiques, would you care for something to drink? Would you like a Coke? And if it's a real high dollar place, would you like some wine or some sherry or something like that? I mean, you're about ready to get hit. 
So I'm just sitting there. Some of you heard me tell us this funny thing. I thought, Kathy couldn't believe it. She said, don't ask Jessica. She's going to tell you. Well, I can't lie. Well, you want me to lie? You want me to go to hell and lie? <laughs> so I'm just sitting there. And of course, this couple come in. And she says, I'm going to get there. I want this outfit. So it was a beautiful outfit. Now, Kathy, she don't just try on one outfit. You get six or seven of them. It only says only three per person. But Kathy don't read that. Three. <laughs> But they know her. She's bought a lot of stuff that they don't care. Just bring in the whole store. They don't matter. So I'm just sitting there. So the man comes up. He looks at me. He didn't say hello. He just went. That's how men do most of them. So we're just sitting there. So I'm waiting for Kathy. Now Kathy is the kind of person that want me to get too, close, too far away from the dressing room because she don't want to come out the dressing room. She want to walk over there in the, and by the dressing room, which makes me look like a dirty old man. <laughs> which I do not want to do. I would rather you come out, because here I am walking where the women dress. What you want? Nothing. I just was going to look at my wife. Sure. No. You know. How many men know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough. Watch this. So I'm sitting there. Here the lady come out. Now, I want to tell you something. The color was her, buddy. It was beautiful. But it's just a little tight. Just, just a little tight. And you know, uh, St. John, I don't know what kind of fabric that is. What they call that? Uh, it's called money. You know that. <laughs> is it knit? Some kind of a knit or something. So she, I have to get up here to show you this. So she's up there. She goes, now women touch themselves all the time. Ladies, what would you do if you seen a man do that? <laughs> but they don't even think twice. About it. <laughs> so I got my head down. <laughs> so I'm not saying that. I'm just going to no, no, wait. Come on, Kathy. Come on. She says, honey. And he looks at, he loves his wife. He, she said, do you think it's too tight? Do you think it's, do you think it's too, do you think it's too tight? And he goes, he didn't answer it. He's smart. He said, honey, you look wonderful. Oh, but do you think it's too tight? Now, you could tell she didn't want to hear that. She likes this thing, man. And she looks nice. Her color is beautiful. But it's just a little tight. So I'm sitting there. I got my head down. I just look at him. And he goes. That's all he got to say. I understand, man. I'm with you, man. I know what you said. So she's still in front of the mirror. She buttons it. Unbuttons it. Here we go again. <laughs> so she says, excuse me. No. <laughs> excuse me, sir. I can hear Kathy go, oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. She says, sir. I said, me, ma'am? She says, do you like this dress? I said, ma'am. That is a beautiful dress. Uh, well, actually, it was a kind of, uh, well, it's a dress, yeah. Uh, but, but, but the thing that comes over it, too, I want, uh, you know, but she's trying on the other part. For, she says, do you like this? And her husband just looking at her, I said, I think you look wonderful. It's beautiful. It's your color, lady. I'm telling you, I, if I was you, I'd get it. I mean, it's, it's really pretty. <laughs> she says, but yes, but, but. <laughs> <laughs> she just, <laughs> I'm going, oh, God. Rapture, rapture, get me out of this place. She said, she said, I don't know this woman. Do you think it's too tight? I said, well, there's a couple of bumps on this side. That's what I said. Look at Kathy, she's still back. She goes, and her husband said, and there's a couple of more bumps on this side. <laughs> You want me to lie? 
I refuse to be confused. A double-minded man is unstable. If I'm gonna lie there, then where else am I gonna lie? She goes, I said, but listen, I know how to fix that. I said, and there was a little Japanese girl. <laughs> she couldn't believe we said there was bumps. <laughs> I said, why don't you have them block it? Block it? We can block it. Now, I don't know how they block the thing. I don't know what blocking means. But they can take that thing back there and make it like another size. Or something. I don't know what they did. They block it. Uh, ladies know what I'm talking about, I guess. Block it. So she went back. I said, Try. So man, they blocked it and no more bumps. They were still there, but we didn't see them. We didn't see them. I said, It looked wonderful. Kathy, I can't believe you told that woman she had bumps on her. And she said it. I didn't say it, Gloria. I didn't say it. I said, Do you want me to lie? Well, no, I don't want you to lie. I said, You know, if you'd have come out and so I could talk to you, I wouldn't be put in these situations. <laughs> So not too long ago, Kathy come out. She goes, she said, do you think this is too tight? I said, oh, there's a bump over here and a bump over here. She got, ha! I said, I'm joking. No, honey. No, it ain't too tight. Red like you. And then they'll attack. Well, you got fat on your body. Hey, we ain't talking about me here. You're the one that brought this up. But I'm not going to lie to her. Because <laughs> you can shut a woman down just that quick about her apparel. Don't do this, gentlemen. You can tell, like, when they, if you come tonight, she puts on, she's in the room, hotel room. Oh, honey, you look wonderful. Good Lord, that thing looks nice. You get in that elevator. You start coming and say, sweetheart, that's almost a little, that's too tight. Lord, say, huh? Tight? Well, you said it looked nice in the room. I know, but I was lying. I'm saying, man, I, she gonna be mad the whole next week. You gotta tell the truth. Which brings me to the other point, living out the will of God. Includes a life of unwavering faith. Write it down. You cannot wave on this stuff. Living out the will of God includes a life of unwavering faith. James chapter 1, 6 and 7, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Let me just say this. If you put your faith in something other than the Lord, it's like you're in the right boat, but you're traveling on the wrong water. You may be in the right boat, but you're traveling on the wrong water. You see, you're being tossed to and fro. That's why I'm not moved by every wave that comes down what I call the religious pike or the church pike. I'm not tossed to and fro. Because what it is, is the Spirit of God just may be repackaged in a new piece of paper, but it's the same. I had a man said one time, he says, do you need any fresh oil? I said, what did you say? Do you need any fresh oil, but just? I said, no, I don't need an oil change. I have no impurities in the oil of the Holy Ghost. What are you asking me is, do I need a lift in my spirit? No. I never, ever ask anybody, including God, to lift me up in my spirit. I stir up the gift of God within me. That's my job to do that. By praying in the Holy Ghost, I build myself up. I don't wait for a meeting to build myself up. I've preached my own revivals. I've been in my own hotel room in front of a mirror. Start, I mean, start speaking in tongues and interpret it. Give an altar call and answer it. Give an offering and receive it. I've done it all to myself. I stir up the gift of God. God said do that. Stir up the gift of God that's within you. Building yourself up, praying in the Holy Ghost. I don't need someone to stir me up or lift me up. The word of God is my foundational truth for all things. Now, when I get around somebody that throws some extra sparks of fire in there, that's a blessing of the Lord. But it's not so I can, oh, not be backslid. I've had many opportunities to get depressed. I don't take any because I know how the devil works. He can't depress my spirit, but he can come against my soul. And that, and I want to tell you something, buddy. I've heard of people talk about depression, and I want, they say they get low. And I mean, I mean, I mean, really bad, some to the point of actual committing suicide, things of that nature. 
that doesn't, that doesn't mean the devil don't attack everybody, but I refuse to allow that to happen. I said, no, no, you're in the wrong boat here, buddy. Uh-uh. So I start talking to myself. Kathy will hear me do that sometime when I'm about ready for a meet. She hear me talking. What you doing? I said, I'm talking to myself. I'm rehearsing. And I can hear the devil going, oh, no, he's going to do this. He's going to do that. I can't believe he's going he's gonna to do it. Ain't no use. We can't win. Leave him alone. I rehearse. Jesse, this is what the word of the Lord says concerning you. I will not waver. I will not detour. I will do what the Lord says. And sometimes my mind goes, what? Say it again. Say, 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 say. See, because the person, you know, the only person that's got to believe everything I say is me. Because if I don't believe everything I say, how do I expect you to believe what I say? Now, Tommy and Virginia, y'all been with me, what, almost 30 years? Huh? Have I ever lied to you? Never. Have I ever done, haven't I done everything I ever said? And I will continue it all the days of my life because I can't separate me from my word. Because these people wouldn't have supported it. This is my first partner. Literally, it's a policeman here. <laughs> Stopped me to give me a ticket. <laughs> and he became my partner. Bless it. Why? I made up my mind. I will not be tossed to and fro. That doesn't mean waves don't come. I just ascend to a higher level. I fly above Christian turbulence. Would God say, come up hither? Come up hither? That doesn't mean, man, at times it looks tough. But I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what I believe in. So if you, if you put your faith in something other than the Lord, it's like you're in the right boat but traveling in the wrong water. Now, how, how do you know it works all the time? Write this down. Clean living. Boy, you've got to say that a lot today in Christianity. Clean living and clear thinking is a priority to unwavering faith. Clean living and clean thinking. Clean living, clear thinking. Sin does not dwell in the will of God. I was attacked not too long ago by, uh, by some homosexual people. They say, you hate us. I said, no, I don't. If I would hate you, then I could not be a Christian. I said, in fact, I like you more than anybody else. I'm just trying to help you. Well, we don't want your help. I said, that's all right. Then don't listen to me. Why are you watching my program? Just don't listen to me. Turn me off. All right, we will. I said, okay. Then we don't have a problem. It's called the clicker. But it wasn't long. What else is he saying? I said, the problem is you like me. And you know I like you. And I am telling you a truth. I can't change you. You're certainly not going to change me. Not that I'm better than you all. It ain't got anything to do with it because God loves us all the same. I said, I'm just telling you the truth. I just don't want you to go to hell. I don't believe in hell. Oh, I said, well, there are no unbelievers after death. I said, you ain't got to. One man said, I don't believe any of that. I said, don't make no difference. That still don't change it. I said, I'm just trying to be honest with you. Well, you don't like me. I said, no. I said, you got better taste than most people I've ever seen in my life. You can decorate a house and you can wear some fine clothes. In fact, you could give me some pointers. I said, what I'm trying to do, mister, is I, you a very nice person. You're a nice person. But I don't want you to go to hell. I said, if the Lord would not say anything about this, ain't none of my business. But since he did say something about it, I have to tell you. And I said, it's not only that, it's stealing. Well, it's hate speech. I said, well, what are we going to change next? Murder? Who, who do you think said thou shalt not kill? The NYPD? No. The Supreme Court? Uh, no. Who said thou shalt not kill? God. So what other law you want to change? Watch this. Let's get over these heterosexuals who think they're so much greater than homosexuals. Thou shalt not commit adultery. What part of thou shalt not you don't understand? It's the same. Do you see my point? It's sin. Sin does not dwell in the will of God. All I'm wanting to do is say, hey, I'm on your side. I'm trying to help you. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, I still don't change it. I have Muslims calling us all the time because I'm all over the Middle East. My program is translated in Arabic, Hebrew, English, Persian, Persian and Farsi. Now we cover the whole Middle East in all languages and they love me. I've had my program played by the Arab network Al Jazeera. 
They hate Americans and they hate preachers, but they like Jesse. <laughs> Play my program. I had a lieutenant colonel call me from Kuwait. He said, I'm watching you on the Arab network Al Jazeera. I said, you've got to be kidding me. They like you. They, thank God they like me. And I get people, go, Muslims, who they took to God? You seem like you took to God too easily. Who they took to God? Could you help me talk to God? I want to talk to God. I love God. I love God. I love God. How can I talk to God? I said, you're talking to the wrong God. You got to listen to the God that I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't try to make Jesus bigger by making Muhammad smaller. Right. That's a theological debate. That's right. That's Jesus is big enough by himself. Yes, I just let my light shine. Yes, yes, yes. I just let my light shine. That's it. That's it. They're coming. The Lord told me to start buying some gas at a Muslim station. <laughs> I said, okay. So I go in there. They go, oh, do you a preacher? I said, yes. On television? Yes. What's you? You are very interesting. <laughs> I like your vehicle. I said, yeah, I'm going to fill it up with gear. Oh, what kind of boots you got on? He said, who? I said, well, the Lord blesses me. Who? I said, the Lord. The Lord who? The Lord. God Almighty. Allah. I said, well, you want to call him Al? It's fine with me. <laughs> How's you want? I'm just blessed today. Well, we never know what Allah will do. I said, I do. What do you mean you do? I said, I talked to him today. You talk to Allah? I said, I talk to God Almighty. Do you think he's God Almighty? Yes. Well, then I must have talked to him. <laughs> we need to have more conversations. I said, well... When I get this tank of gas burned out, I'll come back over here. I'll fill back up. We'll talk to you. Oh, they wait for me. Reverend, you seem so happy. I know you talked to God today, didn't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I did. I said, it's so wonderful. You're a Christian? I said, yes, I am. You know, there's many pathways to God. I said, well, that may be true religiously, but there's only one way to God. But I won't argue with it. I said, let me ask you this. When's the last time you had a good day? I said, I have them all the time. Look at me. Do I look depressed? <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. You are happy. I said, yes. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm going to do when I get there. And I'm never alone. God Almighty. Are oh, you a Christian? I said, the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. You know, the Quran says he's a good prophet. I said, well, God, his father said he's a good God. <laughs> oh, we don't believe that. I said, well, I'm not trying to make you believe. Just do what you want to do. <laughs> we need to have more conversations. <laughs> All of a sudden, here they come. You know what's happening? What's happening here? Holy Spirit doing this. Now, religion would do this. Holy Spirit doing this. I can see it working. I can see it working. He did ask me this. What do you think of Muhammad? I said, I never met him. <laughs> Which brings me to my last point. No one has the right to be resigned to ignorance when there's so much knowledge around. Write it down. No one has the right to be resigned to ignorance when there's so much knowledge around, when there's so much word of God around, and all the ability to get the word of God and say, I did not know. No one has a right to be resigned to ignorance. I don't want to be ignorant. I heard all my life that ignorance was not good. I heard a lot of black people during the civil rights movement that we need to educate our people of their rights that were given to them in 1865. How could Jim Crow laws be passed with all the knowledge that came out of the Lincoln administration? People are not dumb. God don't create dumb people. But just because they're not educated don't mean they're dumb. You, know, you can teach anybody anything if you teach them. 
Just because they don't have, they don't know reading and writing doesn't mean they're dumb. They just, no one's ever taught them reading or writing. So they kept the plantation slave and never teach them to read and write. So they wouldn't know where north from south, east from west is, or how to do that. See, and you could keep somebody in that. And that's what I mean a lack of education. But they wasn't dumb. People are not dumb. God don't create dumb people. Now, people do some dumb things. But that don't mean you're dumb. Right? You see, so you don't have a right to ignorance when there's so much knowledge around. I don't believe in healing. My God, go to Gloria Copeland's healing school. You don't believe it? Watch it. You want to see something? Watch it. But it's not going to make you believe because faith don't come by seeing. You're going to say, that little blonde-headed lady paid that person to jump and scream and say they were healed. I know Gloria Copeland. She don't do that. She jump and shout with them when they do get healed. It's just a blessing. Has a, has a heart for healing. Has a compassion for hurting people. Ah, but you know, you've got to get this by revelations. Spiritual truths must be spiritually discerned. You see what I'm saying? So I realize even if you show people physical evidence, they, they, they'll deny it's true. I got a lot of friends of mine. I, I, I love all kinds of people. And I close with this. I don't know what color you are until you tell me. I have no idea. I never deal with that. I don't mind. I don't, I don't pay a woman cheaper because I can get her cheaper in my ministry. Man, I got some high-powered paying women in my ministry, buddy. They can do the job. They don't care about those kind of things. I tell men in here, so you can't work for a woman, you can't work for me. Or you can't work for a man, you can't work for me. In other words, you work for the person that God has put in that place of authority. And it make no difference. I don't care if she's a woman or a man or what color. They, it make no difference to me. They can do the job. And they pay it accordingly. I don't have a problem with that. I want because I've been controlled by women all my life. <laughs> my mama was the controller of the family. Daddy was the head, but mama was the boss. And then I got married. And between Kathy and Jody, I didn't have a chance. But you know, I enjoyed it because there was a lot of decisions I didn't have to make. And I never looked at Kathy as a lesser species. Because if you want to make my wife mad, ooh, Lord Jesus, make her think that you think a woman is not as smart as a man or that a man can have something a woman can't have. I'll say this in close. At the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Now, I won't tell you, they've been fighting there for centuries. You have the man's side. You got the woman's side. That's the government. That's the way it is. That's according to them. They believe that's the way the Torah is. And that's the end of that. So here come me and Kathy. We so excited. I said, God, that's a wailing wall. Can you believe Jesus prayed there? My God, that's, that's the wall there that Herod made. Now we stand, we walk, I'm so all excited. So as I walk, I walk past like this. Kathy went the one that went, no, no. Oh, I saw them eyebrows go. I said, oh. They think the Arab and the Jews fight. They ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> she said, what do you mean? She said, no, you cannot come here. Go to the woman's side, to the woman's side. That's how they talk, real kind of hard. You know, I brought to the woman's side. I said, Kathy, she goes, I tell you what. I said, Kathy, please go to the woman's side. I'm going to get killed here in Israel. Go to the woman's side. Well, I, you're going to see things I'm not going to see. I don't think that's fair. I said, we ain't here to change the government of Israel. We just want to go to the Wailing Wall. You know, it does extend past to the woman's side. So go to the woman's side. Well, you tell me everything you see. She's shaking that little finger at me. And all them Arabs and all them Jews going. And I'm going, yes, ma'am. Yeah, all right. I tell you. <laughs> this is a true story. So Kathy goes over. I go to walk. They go, nope, nope. I said, what? They call it thing. I call it, uh, you know, um, the little rascals, that little hat you got there. What do they call that? You know, uh, oh, what was his name? Spanky. You see what that looked like? Oh, I said, one of the, I said, how do I keep it on? So he give me a barrette or kind of a, what do they call that thing? A bobby pin or something. Stick it on there. So, man, I'm excited. I can see Kathy like this. I said, <laughs> It's true, man, Kathy. Kathy could have caused a wall, man. 
So I get there, and I get there, and as I stand there, man, I see all kind of pieces of paper stuck in the cracks. Anybody ever been to the Wailing Wall? You know what I'm talking about? Me all in paper. Man, so I, I, I'm walking around, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Nobody's guiding me now. You know, I'm in there. I don't look around. Man, I get there, and I hear this, this guy going. <laughs> He got these uh, he curls that are doing it. So I'm. So I'm. I'm just doing. Well, maybe that's the way you pray here in Israel. I don't know. I thought, well, I'm a praying tongue. I saw the Jewish guy look at me. I said, Finally, he goes, what country are you from? I went, heaven. <laughs> I said it. I couldn't help. He went, oh. <laughs> went back to prayer. Well, I looked all over and I went down this little, I call it a corridor or something down there, where, you know, where you get outside of the people. Boy, and they got some desk and I call them desk. I don't know what they are. Boy, and they're reading it and they don't touch the, the word. Uh-uh. No, touch that with your fingers. They got this silver looking stick or something, you know. I don't know what they call it. Some kind of something. And they just touch it like that. Boy, and has all these long beards and all this guy. And I say, this must be the big rabbi, you know. So I just kind of joined the procession. I've been enjoying it. I said, man, this is where Jesus walked. Boy, this is something, you know. Finally, I'm walking out and I see Kathy. I said, okay. So I, got my, I took my hat off. And I they go, no, no. I said, oh, excuse me, put it back on. So I got all the way to the, to the gate like that. Kathy goes, tell me. I said, tell you what? She said, what did you see? I said, it's a man thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny. She didn't think it was funny at all. I said, I told her this and told her that. She said, you mean you actually pray next to that rabbi? I said, yeah. She, she said, I saw you running like that. I said, well, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. So I did ask one of the younger, I call him a rabbi, I don't know if he's a rabbi. I said, excuse me, why do y'all do this? He said, sometimes we pray so long that we pass out. I said, I've seen Pentecostals fall asleep at an altar myself. I've seen people get knocked out in the Holy Ghost before you know it. You hear them go... And they decide to take a nap. You know how many of y'all have seen that? They take, you got to grab them and pull them up. They're taking a nap on you, man. Get out. He said, you know, we have to do this to keep the blood flowing. I said, well, I didn't know. I said, yeah, I guess that, that makes sense. That makes sense, you know. See, that's a lack of knowledge on my part. And there's been times when I got in a session with God. I'm not talking about throne time. When I just was praying. And man, my leg getting down. Ah, remember the Jewish man. Okay, come on, Jesus. <laughs> All of a sudden, the blood starts flowing, you know. It just works good. See, it's unwavering faith. But suppose it don't work. I don't have that. I don't have the suppose it don't work syndrome. Can I say to give on it? See, Kenneth and Glory Corbin, you taught us too good. You didn't teach us to doubt. And all the years I've known them people, I've never heard Glory go, Jesse, Jesse, I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I don't know. I never heard her say that. Never. Not one time. That doesn't mean the devil hadn't attacked them, because I've been there doing them, doing them attacks. Whoo, some tough things, boy. But they say, they just stay with the word of God. Just stay with the word of God. And I thought, they ain't changing? I ain't changing. Then I dawned on me, well, God isn't changing. If he isn't changing, then we're not changing. And that's just simply the truth. See, I read the end of the book. It does say on the last page, the end. You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away. Another testament. Your mama. No more. I don't care how good the commercials are. And another testament. There is no other covenant. I'm not going to argue with you. You do what you want to do. But there is none. This is it. And if you want to be academic, figure out how long and all the different people that wrote this and the amount of years it took to write it. And many of them did never met each other or knew or ever heard of each other. And it doesn't contradict each other. That in itself is a miracle of God Almighty. Did you enjoy it today? Give the Lord a big God bless you.